Excuse me. <laughs> Mr. President. Senator Gazelka. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant of Arms be instructed to bring in the absentee members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion prevails and the Sergeant of Arms will bring in the absent members. Remaining under motions and resolutions, Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills be made for special orders for immediate consideration. Members, the, the two bills and the sheet is on your desk. Members, the first bill up for consideration is number 127 on general orders. It is Senate File 2415, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senate File 2014, 2415 leverages $100 million in new investments to protect students and families from increased costs by boosting scholarship and grant funds, limiting tuition increases, bolstering successful programs that meet workforce needs, encouraging critical public and private partnerships, and increasing accountability for our public higher education systems. This bill prioritizes Minnesota students by making post-secondary education more affordable, more accessible, and more relevant. By increasing funding and eligibility to the state grant program and ramping up the workforce scholarship program, this bill makes it clear that we are committed to helping student, students access education and training that will prepare them for successful careers in the economy of today and tomorrow. This bill invests an additional $23.4 million into the state grant program, which provides financial assistance to low-income students. This investment allows us to expand eligibility to more students and increase the grant award for every student currently receiving one. Additionally, this bill provides emergency grants to students in times of crisis, when, when, uh, which helps students stay in school when financial challenges outside of tuition would otherwise for, have for, forced them to drop out. The bill also provides for a significant expansion of the Workforce Development Scholarship Program by including additional training programs, adding flexibility to target returning workers, expanding eligibility to a third year, and rewarding campuses leveraging private sector partnerships to increase scholarship awards. Additional funding is also available to campuses who directly partner with employers to increase student exposure to careers that are in high demand. The scholarship program has been very successful in incentivizing students to enter academic programs in high demand industries. This is a win-win because it not only ensures that a student's education is relevant, but also ensures our state has the skilled workforce we will, we will need into the future. In addition to capping tuition at the cost of inflation, this bill also calls on Minnesota State Colleges and University to increase access to online learning by reducing tuition for online courses to match those of on-site courses, as well as ensure contract settlements are limited to money that is actually available. We also call on both Minnesota State and the University of Minnesota to create a plan to reduce administration costs, and we'll hold them accountable to, do, to, to their plans. Members, students were at the center of every decision we made in this bill. The bill holds the line on cost increase at a time when student debt runs the risk of crippling the next generation. Through targeted investments and by asking our public higher education systems. Senator Anderson, please hold for one moment. Members, it's getting very loud in here. We're having difficulty hearing. Members, if you have conversations, uh, keep the volume down or please go off to the side of the chamber. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Through targeted investments and by asking our public higher education systems to hold the line on tuition increases, we're able to help more students access and afford college. By targeting funding to students entering in-demand fields and incentivizing campuses to work with employers, we're also ensuring that the education our students receive is relevant to the future of work in Minnesota in every region of our state. Members, to highlight the provisions in the bill, we have the following provisions in the Office of Higher Education section. $23,412,000 uh, in additional funding for the state grant program. $200,000 in additional funding for College Possible. This is a Senator Cohen uh, provision. 
$100,000 in additional funding for summer academic enrichment program grants. This is a Senator Dietzik uh, provision. $200,000 in additional funding for emergency assistant grants. This is Senator Eichhorn provision. $400,000 in additional funding for the teacher shortage loan forgiveness program. $50,000 in additional funding for loan repayment assistance for public defenders. This is a Senator Abler provision. $500,000 in additional funding for Minnesota Independence College, and this is a Senator Abler provision. $234,000 in funding for student loan debt counseling program, Senator Dreheim. $50,000 for an inclusive access textbook pilot program, that's a Senator Dreheim provision. $50,000 teacher prep program for the blind, this is Senator Senjum. $200,000 for funding for an Anoka Tech Fab Lab. This is Senator Newton. And for Minnesota State, we have $4, uh, $4 million in additional funding for operations and maintenance, $1 million in funding for the Leverage Equipment Fund, $22 million in funding for the ISRS, the Next Generation Technology Fund, uh, their most highest priority on their list of requests, $3 million in funding for skilled workforce partnerships, $15 million in additional funding for workforce scholarship program, $500,000 to fund a requirement of a Z degree at every Minnesota State campus, Senator Dreheim provision, $1.2 million for supplemental aid to small campuses, this is uh, Senator Bach, and $200,000 for additional funding for Cook County uh, higher education, and that's a Senator Bach provision as well. For the University of Minnesota, we have $24 million in additional funding for operations and management. Uh, and, uh, operations maintenance, uh, $200,000 in funding for an advisory council on rare diseases. This is Senator Miller. And $4.314 uh, million is transferred for the health care access fund to the higher education budget to continue funding for the primary care initiatives. Members, we also have many uh, of provisions in the higher education policy bill included uh, in the higher education omnibus bill. Um, and with that, Mr. President and members, uh, I will stand for any questions. Discussion on Senate File 2415, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, President Miller, and uh, thank you, uh, Chair Anderson, for working on this bill. I have the A71 amendment. Senator Dreheim offers the A71 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendments. Senator Dreheim moves to amend Senate File 2415 as follows, page 46 after line 29, insert. This is the A71 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, President Miller. Um, the real simple amendment. It is requested that the tuition and fees for online courses must not exceed the tuition for a comparable online classroom course and this would apply to the U of M. Members, discussion on the A71 amendment. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Dreheim yield for a question? Senator Dreheim will yield. Senator Isaacson. Senator Dreheim, have you reached an agreement with the University of Minnesota on this? Is that why you're offering this amendment? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Mr. President. No, I have not reached any agreement with the U of M. This is a request. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's a wonderful explanation. Thank you. Any further discussion on the A71 amendment? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, appreciate uh, the amendment by Senator Dreheim. Um, this has been discussed. We are making the request for the University of Minnesota to follow suit as uh, Minnesota State and University is as well. So I see this as a friendly amendment. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, would Senator Anderson yield? Senator Anderson will yield. Mr. Senator President, Weger. Senator Anderson, did I hear you correctly that your intent is a request to the University of Minnesota, and that would be similar to the way we would treat the other Minnesota colleges and universities, that it would be a request, not a mandate? 
This, Senator Anderson. Mr. President, Senator Weger, uh, with the University of Minnesota, we are making the request, uh, the request for the uh, tuition online parity uh, with uh, in-person classes would be that the university uh, is, is requested to do so. Minnesota State is, uh, is uh, mandated to do so. Senator Weger. Yes, Mr. President, would Senator Anderson yield? Senator Anderson will yield. Senator Weger. Um, Senator Anderson, uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Why not have a request to each? Uh, they're all providing instruction for Minnesota students and to treat all with the same opportunities, same objectives. Mr. Senator President Anderson. and Senator Weger, uh, if you'd like to make that amendment, uh, we certainly uh, entertain that. This is Senator Dreheim's uh, amendment, so I'm addressing the amendment itself. Senator Weger. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, would Senator Dreheim yield? Senator Dreheim will yield. Senator Weger. Mr. President, Senator Dreheim, would it be considered a friendly amendment? if we were to make this a request, not a mandate, for the other Minnesota colleges and universities instead of a mandate? Senator no, I, I, would I would oppose that amendment to the amendment. Senator Thank Weir. you, Mr. President. We'll revisit that a little later. Thank you. Any further discussion on the Dreheim Amendment? Senator Nelson. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Just a little bit of uh, history. I don't know if I know that uh, amendment exactly, but I do know probably the genesis of that amendment, having served on higher ed several years ago. And those of you who have served on higher ed know that one of the first things you learn is that the University of Minnesota is constitutionally autonomous. And every time that we do something in higher education for what used to be Minsky or Min State and the University of Minnesota, they each have their own paragraphs. The legislature can tell Min State what to do, but there's a special paragraph and special language that we use over and over that is we request the University of Minnesota to do so. That is because it is constitutionally autonomous. It uh, predated our state. Uh, it's something that we do continually, and my experience has been that the University of Minnesota typically takes those requests very seriously uh, when it comes to, um, to following them, although I can't tell you 100%, but my experience has been they take them quite seriously. And of course, I do remind members that uh, while we cannot tell the University of Minnesota what to do, uh, we do hold the purse strings, which may be why they take these uh, requests so seriously. Senator Pappas. Could you guys pass these out? Thank you, Mr. President. As long as we're talking about the um, online tuition differential, I thought I would pass out this kind of four-page explanation of why the online tuition di differential exists is that online courses aren't like correspondence courses and they're not they're not designed to be these kind of boring things that you watch online there's a high expectation that the technology is going to really provide you with a really strong interact interactive experience so teachers have to be trained uh, the staff has to be trained there's a lot of technology behind them if you look at this Q&A it'll really show you why there's a differential and that differential also is, there's been some rumors going around that it's like double the, the regular courses, and that's not the case. For example, from this uh, one example on page four of my handout is that a general site course would cost $144 per credit, and the online course would be $182 per credit. So there's, you know, there's obviously there's a $40 differential there, and that's not insignificant, but it's not double what some people have been saying. I mean, it really is, um, we want our students, and these are mostly older students who maybe can't attend classes in person, uh, but they're trying to upgrade their uh, credentials, and we want them to be able to take these courses. But the reality is, we all know technology is not really cheap. 
technology and having the IT people there to help you and to advise you is really important to have a really good online experience. So um, I don't really support this amendment, and I think there's also problematic language in the base bill about the tuition differential. Further discussion to the A71 amendment. Senator Dreheim. I request a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Roll call is granted. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the A71 amendment.
All senators voting who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 32 nays, the A-71 amendment is adopted. Any further discussion to Senate File 2415? Senator Isaacson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to offer the A-69 amendment. Senator Isaacson offers the A-69 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Isaacson moves to amend Senate file number 2415 as follows, page 46, delete section 39. This is the A-69 amendment. To the A-69, Senator for, Isaacson. First, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Senator Dram for calling for a roll call and making my job easier. That was helpful. Uh, the A-69 amendment is pretty, uh, pretty simple. Uh, the realities of the implications of equalizing the online versus in-person tuition, which have largely been ignored by folks advocating for it, are very clear. It creates a clear deficit and a $65 million hole in Min State's budget spread out over a lot of the different schools. What I'm concerned about is not the spirit of what that amendment or what that idea does in the bill. And I like the idea of us trying to find ways to save money for the university. What I do not like is fiscally irresponsible approaches that pretends like there's not outcomes or unintended consequences for our amendments, but sounds nice as a great platitude or talking point. And that's what I'm really seeing in this particular amendment, and it smacks eerily of the similar feelings I had about the zoo amendment we had last night. A creative way to create cuts with not any accountability, but it sounds nice in a headline. The reality is, folks, and, and to, the, to the honest uh, discussion, I don't know that Min State did a very good job of explaining what happens in online tuition versus in-person tuition. I, I'm not comfortable to, to, to say that I'm happy with what they, what they did to explain it. So I'm handing out an article from that uh, liberal rag Ford's magazine that uh, walks you through how that works and explaining why online courses are indeed more expensive. And so the problem becomes then we're at a junction. Either we agree that the numbers don't back that up and that this is a bad idea, or we don't care that we're making cuts to Minstate unnecessarily. And so I'll, I'll give you a second. I'm still waiting for that to be uh, printed. It's coming out to us here in a second. But just to talk for a moment about what that does. You, if you look, I, I think we all got a handout that explains uh, the unfunded mandate that comes from cutting the online tuition revenue. And you're going to look at the schools, and I encourage all my friends across the aisle to find the school that's in their district, because I know a lot of these are in greater Minnesota. And if you look to the right on the column, it tells you how much money that's going to cost that school in operating revenue. Can I have a copy of that, please? And so, uh, for example, I teach at Century College, which I'm very fond of. And that's a $2 million cut, right? You look at Metropolitan State University, which is a, a, a leading university in providing applied uh, methodology to teaching and to the students, giving them real world experience. Not only that, but a lot of the professors are actually in the fields they teach and does a wonderful job providing people with real hands-on experience in the university, which is a nice balance to what the University of Minnesota does, which is more theoretical based. We're seeing the largest cut there. It's something like uh, $10 million. And so, what I'm, $9 million, excuse me, 9.9. .9. And so, what I'm concerned about is that in the process of trying to do something good for the students, the reality is, is you're actually hurting the students, right? And I, and I know this may be confusing, so just let me walk you through it. When you create an unfunded mandate that now the school has to absorb, that money has to come from someplace else. Right? And contrary to what some of my friends across the aisle would say, their budgets are pretty lean. And so what this does then is it causes them to have to cut from other programs. Placed in the context of the last 10 years in which we've had sustained cuts going to these programs, we are in a spot now where we're having a real difficult time uh, finding new places to cut. And, and I've said on this floor before, uh, I see it every day in how much janitorial services we have at Century. I see it in the kind of program we can or cannot offer for student services, which is part of the academic experience. I see it in the lack of mental health 
providers or counselors and the lack of career counselors or uh, academic advisors to help those students like navigate their way through the university system or the college system. So when we continue to create cuts like this, you're just creating a hole in the budget for the school in your district. That just isn't a good way to manage the budget. Now, if your goal is just to find new and creative ways to cut, uh, hats off to you. You figured out some really innovative ways to create cuts in the budget without having to claim you created cuts in the budget unless someone like me calls you out for it. But if your goal is really to help the students, this doesn't do that. <clears throat> Not only as a, as a senator, but as a professor, uh, and someone who works with students every day, you're not making Minskew, Min State, and you're not making the academic experience for students in any level better for students. By creating this kind of a differential, you may save a student a few dollars, which I always applaud, but on the back end, you're going to ruin the quality of what their education is about. And folks, that's really the point here. I want you to be thoughtful about this. I want you to take a second to look through this impact the Senate bill impact. I want you to look at the schools in your district and ask yourself, where are they going to make that money up? Now, if I was in the other body, I might engage in some political theater and have every member who has a, a, a school maybe stand up and answer some questions about where they're going to find the money. But I, I don't think that's necessary because I think we can find a reasonable request. I think that it makes sense to me, and I hope that the other body will agree, that maybe we should ask some questions deeper into this. We should say, you know what? Min State, we're a little concerned about this. This doesn't make sense on its face value. Perhaps you could explain to us in more detail why this is. And if you can't explain it adequately, then maybe we're going to look at this in the future so you can prepare for it. That would be responsible governance right there. What we're doing here is we're just cutting the money and then say, well, good luck with that, based on a, a amount of information we got from one hearing. And I don't think enough information to understand what's going on. So please read the Forbes article that walks you through the process. Please read the... Uh, articles are the, the, the impact statement I have here, and with that, I will withdraw the amendment. Senator Isaacson withdraws the A69 amendment. Mm -hmm. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, Senator Anderson, I want to thank you for many excellent provisions in the bill. I know you worked very hard and others on the committee and I applaud almost every program that you had cited. Uh, unfortunately, the target was woefully inadequate in terms of the crisis we're facing, in terms of uh, worker shortage, and I know everybody's optimistic that the target is going to improve. But I'd like to continue to focus, though, on the online tuition differential. It was initially stated a hundred million target. The provision on the online differential will have an impact of 65 million in cuts. So this is a loser for the 30 colleges, universities, tech schools that are listed here. I want to mention Century College because it's in the heart of my district. It's also in Senator Chamberlain's uh, district. Senator Housley has many students that go there. Senator Isaacson, Marty, Kent, her others. Uh, almost $3 million will have to be cut. And here is a college that has a, a tuition of approximately 5500 a year and they offer 140 different programs and degrees or certificates. It provides opportunities for over 12,500 students. I was at a meeting at the Chamber of Commerce this morning with members from Century and the, the 916 Vocational School and others talking about pathways for jobs, something I know you share. But the last thing they need is to have a shortfall in their budget. They need to come up with a way of fixing this. And there was a great deal of angst. Uh, you can see this, the sheet that's been handed out on the impact. St. Cloud State, almost $10 million. That's going to come out of programs and cuts. You can't make that money. You can have so many fundraisers. In fact, I'll be at a foundation fundraiser tomorrow at Century where they're trying to raise money. And they will, but they can't keep up with 
these types of cuts. You, and look, Alexandria, almost a million dollars. Anoka Ramsey, nearly four million. And you go down, $65 million in real cuts. I know there's the concern that there should be equality on the tuition charge for online versus the classroom. There's articles that have been handed out. There is research that shows it. Uh, I think we at least should take a closer look at that and what the impact is going to be if we do this. Um, Mr. President, I'd like to offer the A73 amendment. Senator Weger offers the A73 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Weger moves to amend Senate file number 2415 as follows, page 46, delete section 39. This is the A73 amendment. To your amendment, Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. The A73 amendment deletes section 39, uh, a section that Senator Isaacson had just referenced, and instead calls for a report regarding the online tuition differential. And this report would gather information, look at the impact, fiscal impact, et cetera, and report back in January 2020, and then the legislature can further review what that impact is going to be. We need to give the colleges, the techs, the, those schools some breathing room in terms of what this impact is going to be. Remember, if this was signed into law, they have 30 or 40 days to respond. Do you realize students are going to be registering for courses before too long for the fall? Staffing decisions, budgets? $65 million cut for the state. Let's study this. It can be revisit, revisited further. And I ask for a roll call vote. Roll call has been requested. A roll call is granted. Discussion to the A73 amendment, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Mr. W uh, Senator Weger. I appreciate uh, the amendment. I appreciate our discussion on this. Uh, members, uh, this is about the students, this is about the students, this is about the students. And let's just talk about this a little bit because I know this is a topic that uh, has, been, has been mentioned and, and, and um, let's have the discussion. With the advent of technology, members, uh, in every sector imaginable other than government and apparently higher education, Technology has disrupted things and make things cheaper. We are at a constant discussion in our committee and as elected members and, and representatives of our communities to do everything we can to make college more affordable and accessible, and that's what we're trying to do. In this case, members, if we don't challenge the institutions themselves, we can talk about government programming to pay for college, free tuition. We can talk about retiring debt. That is all government spending. That is our tax dollars. When are we going to challenge the systems to curb these costs? So if not now, when? Members, this is really important. And again, I appreciate the comments uh, from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle on this. But I uh, oppose this amendment. I appreciate the sentiment behind it, but uh, I do oppose the amendment. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, President. And uh, thank you, uh, Senator Weger, for the, the amendment. I, I stand in the opposition to the amendment. And obviously, this is uh, my bill inside of uh, Chair Anderson's uh, bill. And just a little background, you know, the whole idea when we came up with this bill and dropped it was to make college more affordable. And, and many of us have door knocked the last few years. And when you door knock a household with a kid in school, 
One of the topics that comes up almost every door is college affordability, and that's what we're trying to get at. And it's for the students and their families. And, and you think about who takes online courses. There are a lot of working families that take online courses. People that are trying to work full-time go back to school. Maybe students with young families that want to spend more time at home with their children are taking online courses. But just for a, a couple comments on the handouts. So um, why college tuition is actually higher for online programs. The article, um, I, I'm not sure who handed that out. I can't read the signature. Um, but they reference Arizona State University. And they talk about the difference in pay for online courses versus on-campus courses. But a lot of these national online institutions charge similar to our out-of-state tuition. So if we're going to compare tuition to tuition, do we charge the same for people outside of Minnesota that aren't Minnesota residents? Of course we charge them more. So it would be the same thing. So I don't, I don't put a lot of validity into this article that was handed out. Thank you for the information, though. And then uh, men stayed. I dropped this bill on 119, three and a half months ago almost. I had not seen this form from Men's State until Senator Pappas was nice enough to share it with everybody tonight. Um, I have not had a chance to read it, but part of my frustration is I think the system was trying to hide the fact that they were making $32.5 million a year off of our kids. So I think it, it's gut, gut check time. Who is more important, the students or a revenue source for the university? Thank you. Further discussion of the A73 amendment, Senator Isaacson. Well, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, excuse me, at least we're finally getting honest. First of all, the premise of uh, uh, Chair Anderson's comments was text makes everything cheaper, and I can tell you that my phone is not cheaper since tech came around, and I don't think that comment's valid. <sighs> the next thing I heard is it's about the students, it's about the students, and it's about the students. And, and if, if you're willingly ignoring the effects of a budget cut on a university, then I suppose you can say that. But the reality is, is that this actually ruins the student experience and inhibits the quality of education, which is what we need to be at a high standard. I think you want to be at a high standard. And so finally, I felt like you guys got honest and like, this is really about cuts, which is what I've been saying all along. So I appreciate that we can actually have the conversation that we really should be having right now, that this is actually just about finding new ways to cut the system. And, and I think Senator Draheim really, really played the card well when he explained that he thought that Minn State was trying to hide this. If you come from the premise that government is bad, or that these organizations or bureaucracy are somehow bad, then I suppose you're gonna go look for things that fit that narrative. My experience in higher education is that the role of government, and especially in the role of higher education, is to make people's lives better. I am personally believing the reason why we didn't see more information about this is because I don't know if anybody believed you'd actually pull this out and, put, and make this a part of the bill. The article explained very clearly why online rates are more expensive, yet you glossed over that and talked about how it's out-of-state versus in-state tuition, not acknowledging the part of the article that actually walks you through what's more expensive, almost as if that just wasn't there. It's not like we're up here just making things up over here. The reality, of the fa the reality is this, and it's very simple. When you put this bill through, and if it were to become law, you create cuts in a system that's already been cut to pieces, and you're going to create more cuts. And in some ways, it makes me feel like there's been this thread throughout the system, throughout the uh, throughout this session, that talks about it somehow like Min State is the villain here. Min State's not the villain, folks. If you want to see the villain of of higher tuition, go look in the mirror. Because the reality is, is higher tuition continues to happen because we do not invest in higher education at the level that is necessary to give us what we need. And then on the back end, you want to cut their, tie their hands on their back by holding tuition straight. Now, I don't have any problem with, and I like the idea of holding tuition flat if we can, but we can't, it, it, the money doesn't just magically appear. 
I asked in committee, Chair Anderson, where is the money going to come from to make up for this loss? And you did not answer the question. I don't expect you to know. You're not in the administration. It was a, it was a um, hypothetical question to illustrate. This is not thought out. This is fiscally irresponsible. This is harming the student experience and the educational uh, system that we want to protect and hold strong. This amendment uh, uh, allows us to kind of fix that. And so I'm very disappointed that I continue to hear uh, the hyperbole I do about it's supposed to be about the students when the reality is anybody looking at this can tell you're harming the university system by what you're doing. And then pretending like it doesn't and hiding behind this mantra that it's about the students, no matter how many times you say it, whether it's once or 5,000 times here, that doesn't make it right. And it doesn't make it true. This is not about the students. This is about finding new and ingenious ways to make cuts to government. And while I don't have a problem with prudent cuts where they should be there, let's do them in a thoughtful manner. This is not that. The President's going to issue a reminder to follow the Senate rules on avoiding personality in the debate. Uh, but further discussion to the A73 amendment, Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President, members. Um, so I, I went to community college back when, for some reason, we could still pay part of that tuition and afford it. Who knows what's happened in the last 20 years that sent these things, uh, these uh, tuitions through the roof. A lot of reasons, I suppose. Um, I like Century College. I think they're doing great work. So this is a tough issue for me. It really is. And to my good colleague in the front row there, Senator Isaacson, uh, there's a lot of non sequiturs going on here. One thing does not necessarily lead to the other, and we've got to draw correct conclusions. We all want the same thing, right? Good things for students, low costs. The attempt here, I think what we should be doing here, uh, Mr. President and members, is instead of screaming at each other and making accusations that we just want to throw kids and students out on the street and deny them an education, perhaps we should discuss the rational, rationally discuss a reasonable solution to the problem. The fact of the matter is tuition has gone through the roof. And people out there, as Senator Dreham has mentioned, are seriously concerned about the cost of tuition and be able to afford that for their kids. So let's have that discussion instead of throwing out wild, crazy accusations. I like Century College. I went to Normandale. I think these are critical, vital institutions that do great work. They are. But there's something wrong here. There's something just the, the average citizen is going to say, why would it cost more to do this when most of all the private sector goes to in technology and non-paper to save dollars? There's a natural common sense question here that we need to address and address it rationally to come to a conclusion. It's not either or. We can have a discussion about what is right what might work, and maybe come to a compromise. But just throwing in accusa accusations is not going to help in a bunch of non sequiturs. So the thing I'll leave you here with is that just a last reminder, the state's broke. There's no billion-dollar surplus. The fact of the matter here is, members, the state is broke because we spend too much and we're reckless with the people's treasures. We think we can continue to go back to the bank, shake them down, bring it in, and give them whatever they want. On the other side, we're broke, and we're not going to be unbroke for a while. So we either face this challenge, work through it rationally, compromise and deal with the problem, and stop throwing out accusations, or we're going to be dead broke, and we're not going to have all these good things that we have. So we have serious issues that require serious conversation and not just wild accusations. So these, these community colleges are great assets to this state. I've been to them. I support them. I went to them. And it's not unreasonable for the average citizen to ask the question and for us to respond and say, can we do something here? Is there something wrong? But we, we have the responsibility 
to make sure these institutions, this state, is a going concern well into the future. So I suggest we look at these problems rationally, deal with them like adults, so we can go on in the future and provide these educations for our kids and continue to thrive, else we can't. So throw out all the accusations, but that doesn't solve a problem. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I have on my list Senator Abler, Latz, Nelson, and Marty at this point. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President, and I actually very much appreciate the debate, and I appreciate uh, the discussions in the Higher Ed Committee with uh, Senator Isaacson and others, and uh, the passion uh, in, with which he uh, presents everything. And, um, and, and so I just have a few thoughts, and Senator Weger, too, I really appreciate your passion, and you've been actually a guide to me in some ways over the years, and I really appreciate that. Um, but I, uh, there's a couple things, and I'm just going to keep it to a couple. Senator so, Eisenstein, I actually read the article you gave me, which I appreciate, um, which uh, actually says that 74% of the schools charge the same for their online courses. Um, and that some other ones charge more, and they give reasons that are certainly valuable. Um, but 74% is like more than half. It's like it's almost three quarters. And, and so the question that recurs to me is when I heard about this, uh, I still have all my teeth, but if, if they almost fell out of my head when I, $65 million, holy cow. And, you know, I don't know if, even if Minnesota State recognized the trap that they were getting into as they were imposing on the students. And the $65 million uh, comes out of those families. And the issue of affordability and, and people being barred from chances, chances to even get to higher ed. And I come from a relatively blue collar area and, and a lot of my, uh, probably not even half of my folks uh, make it across the finish line to get to something advanced. And that's been a big issue for me and Anoka Tech and Anoka Ramsey, et cetera. Um, and I certainly, in my world, uh, Senator Isaacson, in terms of my motives, I have no intention to reduce anything at my sites or Century College, Senator Uyghur, or anywhere else. And, but I just want to remind folks uh, that the IFO, uh, which is a group that I also have a lot of respect for, on their list of concerns about Minnesota State, they talked about high administrative costs. And this is actually part of that. And, and I would encourage folks, rather than just simply taking the $65 million and dividing it by how many institutions uh, Minnesota State has, and we need every one of them, uh, that we think that maybe it wouldn't have to be exactly landing per capita, per site, the way that uh, someone does the math. But if this were to go into law, I would hope that, that we would look long and hard at the central office and how we do our business, the very discussions I've been having since I've been in office, like why are we, uh, why are prices going up so much all the time? And so, uh, Senator Anderson, Senator Dreheim, I really appreciate the discussion, this is provoking, and if we can, through the course of this conference time, find a way to, to get after some of these costs, those costs are all going to go back right onto the students, and we just might see several hundred or a thousand or more students from my area and across the state actually getting a chance to succeed with the, uh, with the Minnesota dream. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm sitting here a little bit confused because if we listen to Senator Chamberlain, the state is broke, and if we listen to Senator Gazelka, the state has a billion-dollar surplus. In fact, I think the majority's whole budget scheme is built around that concept. So I really am confused what the state of the state's finances really are. But I thought it would be helpful uh, to do a little more of a historical look at why tuition has been going up. When I first got elected to the House in the 2002 election, entered in 2003, Governor Pawlenty was a governor, and we, we, had a, uh, we had a very tight budget. We made cuts. At the time, I think the statute might even still reflect this, uh, but at the time, the state provided about uh, two-thirds of the cost of running our higher education system to the University of Minnesota and uh, what was then just called Minsku, uh, Minnesota State Colleges and University System. Two-thirds. 
we proceeded in the, the four years that I was in the House on the Higher Ed Committee to cut hundreds of millions of dollars out of the state funding for our higher education systems. And the reason why that was done under the leadership of then Governor Pawlenty was because, number one, he was so opposed to the concept of tax increases as a means for closing a revenue shortfall in uh, the state budget projections. But he apparently was not, and the majority in the House was a very strong Republican majority. Uh, the majority was just fine with the concept of passing along the higher education costs to the tuition payers. It was an implicit, if not an explicit, part of their budget that the costs of the cuts that the state was making to higher education was going to be made up by the systems when they increased tuition to pay for their ongoing cost of delivering the education. And that happened for years and years. We now pay about one-third of the cost of higher education in Minnesota through the state budget. About one-third. We're at funding levels that are in real terms something like 1982. So if you really want to look at why our students and their parents are paying more in tuition, it's because we as a state have utterly failed to pay the cost of the public good that higher education is for all of us. I said at the time, and I still believe it to be true, that tax at that time would really have been better spelled as T-U-I-T-I-O-N. Tuition. Our system is still called the University of Minnesota, but in very real terms, in terms of financial support, it's more the university in Minnesota because it's much more financed now by the private tuition payments of the students and their parents than it is by public dollars. Certainly not state public dollars. There's a fair amount of federal research money that still goes to the university. But we really have more of a private system than we have a public system. And that's because of the budget cuts to our higher education systems, which are reflected in this budget before us today. Now, quite frankly, I'm not sure why we are meddling in the kinds of decisions about what a university is going to charge for this course versus that course. I'm not even sure the legislature is well suited to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, we ought to be making decisions that are more broad in nature and let the institutions that are actually delivering the services uh, make some decisions like this on their own. Uh, but you certainly can't say that this is all about the students and, uh, and then we just want to make sure that the university has no other means for raising their revenue to deliver the educational services to the students. Because if it's all about the students, what they really want is to have a good learning experience and to graduate with a degree that's going to have them prepared to enter the workforce. That's what we need to keep our eye on. Further discussion on the amendment? Senator Nelson. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, the senator from St. Louis Park and the senator from Anoka have kind of set the stage uh, as we flesh out the amendments before us regarding online learning, coursework online, and the costs that go with those. And just to set the stage a little bit, let's remember who we're talking about here. We're talking about the students of today and tomorrow. And members, these are digital natives. These digital natives grew up in the digital era and they're used to accessing content when they want, where they want. And online courses provide that opportunity for them. It also allows them to progress at their own pace. Things that we know are important when it comes to academic learning. We also know that our students 
are faced with some of the highest student debt in our land. The last I looked, Minnesota, Minnesota students, on average, had the fourth highest student debt in the nation. Those numbers may have changed a little bit, but certainly not significantly. Our students are graduating with a ball and chain around their ankles, a ball and chain of excessive student debt that is causing them to delay things, sometimes like marriage, having children, get, buying a house. It is changing the way that our students live and their options in the future. So yes, we must and we should support digital education. And at the same time, we should be trying to reduce the student debt that our students have. Now, this is more than just who pays or how much the state paid and how much do the parents pay. If you look at the numbers, you will see that higher education costs have been outpacing the rate of inflation. That's something we should all be concerned about. And as the senator from Anoka noted, uh, in the great uh, Forbes article that was handed out to us, it's very clear that three quarters of the higher education institutions charge their online learners the same as in-class learners. I think we should be part of the 74% who are able to charge the same amount, not more, for online learning. And let, let us do take a quick look at the costs, because the costs are important. It is costly to develop a great online course. About a million dollars to develop uh, a great online course. I can speak to the, to the high school side of things or the middle school side of things. A great Algebra I online course costs about a million dollars to develop. Those are significant costs. But there are not the costs of the classroom, the facility, the heating, the lights, all of those hard costs. But here's the thing about digital online learning. Yes, it is. It can be more expensive in the beginning. But digital online learning is scalable. And as it is scalable, it is less expensive. Plus, it can ensure that every student has the best English 101 professor. And it Every student could have that professor, not just the ones that are able to cram into the classroom. And I'm thinking about the former chancellor of what at that time was Minskew. I remember one of the first articles I read about uh, Chancellor Rosenstone before I even met him. He talked about his vision for Min State at that time, which was looking at scaling digital education, online learning. I remember him saying he wanted to make sure that every freshman at the Minnesota State University Colleges had the very best English 101 professor. Those things are possible with digital online learning. My hope is the provision in front of us will encourage our online learning our institutions to get to that point where these great online courses are scalable. And that is one of the beauties of online uh, education. So I support the provision before us. Minnesotans, we can figure out how to do this. We've been doing online learning for a long time. And I'll just take an aside here. I took the very first online learning course that the University of Minnesota offered was part of my master's degree, and it was back in 1997. Our universities have been doing this for a long time. It is time that we get to the point where they can capture not only the advantages of personalized online learning, 
but the scalability of it and the cost. And I believe they are up to it. I think that's the direction we're headed with these amendments. Further discussion on the A73 amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an interesting debate to listen to, and I think hearing some of the things Senator Nelson was saying, how you can get the scalable system of education here. This language in the bill where we have to charge no more for online courses and other ones sounds very reasonable. Matter of fact, I think most people think it should be cheaper, less expensive. And they think of these old correspondence courses. They mail you the stuff, email you the stuff, you read it, you fill in a, a multiple choice exam, it grades itself electronically, and whether, you're charged, whether you have 10 students in the class or 10,000 in the class, the costs aren't any higher, it's all electronic. But that's not what higher education's about, and that's not what these courses are like. I actually got a call from the president of St. Paul College, which is the most diverse, far majority of its students are minority students, probably the lowest income students of any of our public higher education institutions in the state, and a guy who cares very deeply about the students who are struggling, many of them coming back later for higher education. And he talks about, you teach a, you teach a course in anthropology in a classroom, you have 40 students there. He says, you try and do the same thing online, you might take 25, because it's that much more work. It's a lot harder. As one who grew up in a family very in, involved in higher education, my dad teaching for 35 years, I don't think he ever used the same lecture twice. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure he never did. Every time you're changing, you're adapting to what's happening. Maybe some technical introductory biology course, it's going to be the same all the time. But most higher education faculty are constantly changing. And they're putting a lot of work into it. And some of these classes are cheaper than in-person courses. Some of them are much more expensive. Some are somewhere in between. And a lot of them have course costs at the beginning that you can pay off over time. But for us to step in as a legislature and say, because it sounds good, because people get the sense, hey, you can charge the same for, you make more money, every student you get is cheaper because you don't have to do any more work for them. If you're gonna provide online tutoring for people, if you're gonna proctor the exams appropriately, if you're gonna help follow up on everything, it's not, it could be cheaper in some cases. Some cases it could be far more expensive. And for us to do this when, again, the St. Paul College president said this would really hit them hard. He said they're already being hurt by this legislation. He's saying they're trying to help their students. And we're going to come in there and arbitrarily, because it sounds really good, it sounds like we care about the students. Let's let them do the best they can and do the best. If we think they're doing something wrong, correct it. But don't do an across-the-board thing saying, oh, it should be cheaper for you to do it electronically because it doesn't cost you any more to email something to 1,000 students than to 100. But that's not the way it works. The, the gut-level reaction, it ought to be cheaper, isn't the reality. It's not the reality, and it won't be the reality if you care about the students. And I think that we should recognize that Senator Weger's amendment makes a better decision. Let's study the issue. Let's not come in here with a mandate that they have to charge the same amount regardless of what the costs are. That would be unwise for us to do, and it's, not a, it's certainly not a benefit for higher education institutions, and it's certainly not a benefit for the students who we want to have a good education. Further discussion on the A73 amendment, Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just wanted to speak to uh, the next generations and the generations in school now and, and say that um, this is a distraction from the actual problem, which is over the last few decades we have underfunded higher education and tuition and school costs have gotten out of control. So whatever debate we have here tonight or in the next few weeks about this issue is only a distraction. 
Uh, but I thought I'd sit on the actual economics of, of the principle of, of having online classes being equal uh, to that of uh, physical in-class classes, uh, which is we know that that's going to raise the, the cost of the on-campus classes. We know that. Um, and so if you think about it in, in how it actually works, no one replaces their entire uh, degree online at our, at our campuses. It's, it's very rare that you can and would do that. Um, so oftentimes, online classes, at least the way I used them when I was in, in school, was to uh, make the schedule work, make my schedule work around the other on-campus classes so I could go to work or, at the time, be mayor. Um, and so that's how I worked it. It wasn't a replacement nor could you. Um, so what's actually going to happen is no one's going to save any money because you're going to take the online class, which will be at a little lower rate under the bill, I will admit, but then you're going to have to go to your other on-campus classes and those rates are going to be a little bit higher. So what we're doing here is uh, spinning the wheels. We're not really doing anything to save anybody any amount of money. So those that are about in college or about to attend college, this will not help you. Um, don't be distracted by the underlying issue. Hold us here accountable uh, to, to actually fund our higher education institutions. Thank you, Mr. President. Seeing no further discussion on the amendment, the Secretary will take the roll.
Well, they uh, also changed the language. So the money that's going to not be used to prepare or screen seats will be used once there's an outbreak. All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 nays, the uh, motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Members, we are back on Senate file 2415, Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. In the spirit of compromise, I'd like to offer the A74 amendment. Senator Weger offers the A-74 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Weger moves to amend Senate File 2415 as follows. Page 46, line 29. This is Amendment A-74. To the amendment, Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this would continue to have the study, and I believe we all acknowledge the importance of containing higher education costs, that digital education is a part of the future. In fact, it's been a part of us for uh, well over a generation. All of my kids were in uh, online courses. I'm in online courses just for my professional license, and I imagine a number of you are. It's a part of it. The thrust of the discussion that I made before was there's $65 million in unanticipated shortfall. They get it, the local colleges, universities, tech schools. They understand about the growth for online education. They're doing it. They're working with the business community and preparing workers. But for the, and I don't believe there's hidden money at Century College. I believe they need a little breathing room, and so this would change the effective date to July 1, 2020. I can't imagine that the proposal here, as originally before us, would actually become law. It would be devastating. And I believe it's the intent that we send a message. This would send a message, but it also could give some comfort for those colleges and the others that are working on this. That. Uh, we want to try to get a, a consistent or nearly consistent uh, tuition. And I, as much as anyone here would like to see tuition as low as possible, but it needs to account for what the impact is going to be on the staffing in various programs. So I offer this in the spirit of compromise and that we reach a resolution. Discussion on the Uyghur A-74 amendment, Senator Drehan. Thank you, President Miller. Um, you know, just one more comment on, on this as, as we're having this great discussion. Um, one school, Georgia Tech, charges only what it costs or, or break-even cost for an online master's in information technology. The cost of that degree is currently $6,600. This is the cost for the entire degree. For a master's program, for a college that's ranked eighth in computer science. science. So eighth in the country, their cost for the whole master's program is $6,600. So we can do it, and we can do better and we can have uh, a more affordable uh, online courses. So I, I stand in opposition to this amendment, and uh, thank you. Further discussion on the amendment, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Senator Weger. It's twice, I'm, I apologize. Um, again, I appreciate the spirit of the amendment. 
Um, I don't think we're done with this discussion, but uh, I, I will, for the same reasons, uh, oppose this amendment. Uh, members, we, uh, uh, we need to uh, do something on this, and uh, I, again, I oppose the amendment. Further discussion on the amendment? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, and members. Uh, when I hear the discussion and the concern for the universities or the schools and their shortfall, boy, I took a total different look at it. I said, wow, that's a $65 million benefit to students and parents. $65 million for the students and for the parents. I see that as a good thing, and I certainly would not want to vote against or vote for something that would take away a $65 million benefit for students and their parents. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion on the A74 amendment, Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm beginning to wonder if my microphone's working. I'm, I'm confused as to how we can just pretend like certain facts aren't real. I, I don't understand that. Addressing something my two friends behind me spoke about regarding the 75% of schools that apparently pay the same amount or less or whatever for online tuition, if you just read another line down in that same paragraph, they're quite clear that at best case scenario, online courses cost the same and more than likely cost more. If you look even farther in, that in the same article, it talks about how uh, Florida's Board of Governors found that it costs $41 more per credit to do online courses. So I mean, we could probably sit in cherry pick schools all day long, uh, uh, whether it's Georgia Tech or the University of Florida or whatever. Uh, it doesn't change the reality. You're right, it's a wonderful benefit the state should provide uh, that Senator Kiffmeyer refers to. I agree, we should absolutely do that if we just pay for it. And that's been the problem all along, folks, hasn't it? The problem all along has been, we're not taking our responsibility to take care of our schools. The problem all along is, is one side seems to think that there is something nefarious occurring in our higher education system. I don't understand that mental philosophy that approaches education that way, like there's some gotcha that we're trying to get that doesn't make sense to me. I think I'm, I'm not even comfortable with Senator Weger's amendment because I think it goes too far in your direction, but I would even work with that if it gave us a chance to have an honest discussion. folks. I feel acerbic about this because I don't feel like it's a genuine argument, and so it frustrates me when I have to listen to this. But I'm open enough to understand that there are real questions that should be answered, and I don't disagree with those questions being answered. I think the university should have to answer those questions. So let's give them the chance to do that. Let's give them the chance to do that and explain, and if they can't explain it, then fine. Let's cut that tuition then. Let's do that if they can't explain it. When they came in the first time to talk about it, I don't think they adequately explained it. The conversations I've had since then did much more adequately explain it. The way I've explained it here and the way other schools do it does adequately explain the problem. So if we're really concerned about that, we should ask that question. We should have them in. We should let them explain it to us. We should do the study as explained. And you know what? If they can't do it in a year, then I guess it kicks on. But at least give them a chance to prepare for it. We're not even doing that. That's just fiscally irresponsible. And if I hear more people talk about how this is all about the students, that is just not true. Because what you're doing is hurting the students in the quality of education they're gonna get. I'm not just making that up. I see it every day in the classroom. I see it every day in the university. These cuts are detrimental to our school, period. To pretend it's otherwise Mr. President, just point false. Of order. Senator Chamberlain, uh, please state your point of order. This is just a slight nuanced point of order, but it deals with intent. I'm not a big rule guy, but he's implying intent on the other side. He can't do that. What they say is what they say. He can believe what he wants, but he cannot imply intent on the other members. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. Members, just a friendly reminder, please keep your uh, your discussion to the topic at hand. Uh, we're on the A-74 
74 amendment. Senator Isaac. Thank you, Mr. President. So I hope that we'll take the time to seriously look at this the situation. I think if we want to have a legitimate discussion about it, I would love to be a part of that discussion. I would love to ask those questions with you. I would love to get some answers. And if we find out that indeed there is a problem, I would be with you in supporting solving that problem. But once again, we are uh, looking, we have a problem in search of a cause, or a solution in search of a problem. Uh, that doesn't work, and I, I hope that you'll support the amendment. Thank you. Further discussion on the amendment? Senator Weger. Yeah, the final words. Mr. President, and uh, Senator Drenheim, others, uh, you had mentioned the sheet that Senator Pappas handed out. Uh, I had just learned about this over the Easter break you know, when uh, President uh, Angelia Melender contacted me during break and including the Easter weekend, and as well as other college presidents and others saying, what are we going to do? I don't think they had anticipated what was going to happen. And what might be messaged as a $65 million benefit for students, what I'm told is it's going to result in cuts, and it will impact students. So they're just asking for some time to address it. Uh, the, the part that concerns me as we go into the conference committee process and not too much time is a, a memory that I have when I was once the chief conferee on the E-12 bill and with uh, Representative Loon. And uh, there's a lot, uh, you know, a great deal of, you know, billions of dollars in programs at stake, and you have a lot in this bill. And there may be a few items at the end that you aren't in agreement, and the clock is ticking. And then, if you haven't, and there will be a great deal of pressure. And what s the colleges and others are worried is that could this just be a casualty in conference where the clock is ticking. And I remember when there were four or five items when Representative Loon and I couldn't reach an agreement, did our best, and then in came Speaker Doubt and Leader Bach. And, and uh, Representative Loon and I, we could offer maybe a minute or so on each point, but then those two would decide in, out, in, out. There's maybe 30 seconds on each. And that could happen to this as well. And that is the concern as we get closer to the end as to what could happen. And it's not necessarily in the transparency that we're all talking about. They're trying to put their budgets together, getting ready for the end of the school year, registrations for next, and this will cause a cut. So in the spirit of compromise, this would still have the effective date from a year from now, but let's study that impact. Thank you. And I'd like a roll call. Uh, roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Members, any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll.
All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Members, we are back on Senate File 2415. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A67 amendment. Senator Clausen offers the A67 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Clausen moves to amend Senate File 2415 as follows. Page 7, line 21. This is Amendment A67. To the amendment, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the A67 amendment removes Section 44, which is entitled uh, Intrusive Pilot Program. It's found on page 50 of the Senate file 2415. Section 44 requires the Office of Higher Education to establish a grant program for Minnesota state colleges and universities that currently use inclusive access for at least 20% of the offered courses with the goal of expanding to 60% of those courses using inclusive materials. Now, somebody is probably asking, what are inclusive? What's inclusive access? Inclusive access provides digital course materials instead of traditional textbooks. All students in a class are provided access to the digital material, reducing student textbook costs. Now, I certainly support the concept to address textbook affordability, but I have three concerns with the pilot program as it is identified in the bill. The first is the grant requires applicants already using inclusive access in 20% of their courses with the goal of expanding to 60% of the courses. My question is why invest in state dollars, why invest state dollars in institutions that already have implemented an inclusive access program? These institutions are well on their way to expanding their inclusive access program on campus to students. The inclusive access pilot language refers to as in one grant recipient. In other words, it looks like that this grant is going to be for a campus, not several, just one. This grant appears to be developed for a specific campus. Uh, can I ask that question? Is it? And Minnesota State has over 30 campuses. It seems to me that multiple campus grant locations would be of greater value. My second concern with Section 44, regarding that it assists a for-profit textbook company by providing public funds to expand their sale of materials, resulting in greater profits. Digital textbook vendors can easily enter into agreements with individual campuses by providing their own incentives, if they wish, through negotiations. They don't need public funding. Inclusive access is an increasing popular program across the country, which has merits in reducing textbook costs and is expanding on its own merits. I'm not sure that we really need to spend state funding to assist in that process, especially to textbook companies that have made millions of dollars in sales. My third concern is the Office of Higher Education is instructed to administer the grant process without identified funding. So what we have is an unfunded mandate on the Office of Higher Education. So in conclusion, the amendment removes $50,000, the allocation, and reallocates funds to the Emergency Assistance for Post-Secondary Homeless Student Program. I'm not in opposition, again, to inclusive access digital materials. There is no doubt that such programs can reduce traditional textbook costs. I just question the need for a state-funded grant program to assist digital textbook companies and vendors to increase their own market share. They can do that on their own. The limited scope of the pilot is also troublesome. 
when the campus criteria limits grant applicants to an existing campus where already 20% of the courses are using digital educational materials with the goal of expanding to 60%. I just, this, using uh, state funds for this, I just think is really inappropriate. Uh, these textbook companies have millions of dollars. The exclusiveness of this is something I think we, we should be avoiding. And uh, I think that uh, individual institutions, campuses, uh, can enter into their own agreements with uh, these companies. So thank you, Mr. President. Discussion on the Clawson A67 amendment. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Claussen, uh, for the amendment. We have had this discussion uh, in committee, and uh, there's an amendment uh, as we rolled out the, marked up the omnibus bill. Uh, members uh, oppose this amendment. A vote for this amendment is a vote for higher textbook costs. We are trying to do what we can to curb costs for students, curb costs on um, overall just costs, and, and textbooks is a big deal. This is a $50,000 pilot program. A pilot program, uh, the, pro the, the proposal does not mandate use of inclusive access. Instead, it taps into the work of a willing partner that is already doing the work. And that's to reduce textbook costs for students. So our bill is, again, focused on making college more affordable for all students, and textbook costs are a big part of this. So, members, this is a $50,000 pilot program, and this institution is already a willing partner. So uh, I urge a no vote on the amendment. Further discussion on the amendment? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, President. Just a couple points uh, on this uh, bill. Um, the studies show that they have higher pass rates with this program, meaning more kids finish the coursework. Students save money. Average cost is $50 less per course. And probably the most important part, students are more engaged. The numbers show when students use a program like this, uh, it goes from 44% doing the uh, assignments up to 77%. So I, I urge a no vote on this. Further discussion on the amendment? Senator Isaacson. My mom uh, always told me I, if I'm going to say bad things, I should try to say good things too. So it's a new, new development. So the other side's prepared for that reality. Uh, I have to compliment. Uh, Senator Dreheim and Senator Anderson with no misgivings that I think that they are onto something when they're talking about textbooks. Uh, I can tell you as a professor that the book, book I could use for my class, a social science book, costs between $130, $150. And uh, what I do is I just require them to buy an older version. Uh, oftentimes my students will spend more on the shipping than they do on the actual book when they buy it on Amazon. Uh, what I, I, and so I think that they're onto something, and I look forward as this moves forward because I think that they have the right idea here. And I think if you want to put money back in the students' pockets, taking care of the textbook costs is one of the quickest ways to do it, and the most complete way for the, money, the students to have the money right then at the beginning of the semester. The problem I have with this particular amendment is that it costs us fifty thousand dollars to help a corporation, which makes money off of students, create a program which makes the school dependent on the program. Uh, and the problem is, is really, let me just walk you through what the real nuance is. If this program's included, what Pearson told me was it was an average $20 savings per student, not 40 or 50 or whatever was said. And that what happens is, is that the program, like let's say my department decides it's going to adopt this program. Now every teacher must use this textbook. And so instead of spending $140 in the textbook, they might spend $100 or $120, $120, $120 excuse me, for, instead, of, instead of spending $140 in the textbook, they'll spend between $100 and $120 in the textbook, right? And I don't have a choice, and it's built into their tuition. Or they could take the course from me in which they spend $17 on textbooks, which I'm, just, I'm not a math guy here, but 
carry the two, I think it's over $100 savings. And we've actually put money back in the students' hands. So I like the direction and the intent and the spirit of this idea, uh, but I really am concerned that A, uh, the publishers are the reason why the prices are so high, so I'm not sure why we get in bed with the publishers again when clearly we've been burned once by the students. Secondly, if you want to save money, there are money, much more effective, cost-friendly ways that doesn't give money, state money, to a corporation that allows for the, for the books and fees to be, or the books to be less. And so I, I hope that you'll consider uh, and, and support uh, Senator Clausen's amendment. Thank you. Further discussion on the amendment, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and just a clarification, members, this, this is uh, not to a corporation. This is to cover the cost of a report to come back and tell us uh, the, the, the impact of this. So this is not going to a corporation. This is to uh, help the institution with uh, covering the cost of the report, which I think we can all agree uh, when we're talking about textbooks, this is, this is a helpful thing guiding us forward. Thank you. Again, I urge a no vote on the amendment. Further discussion, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, I'm glad that uh, Senator Anderson just clarified that because my next question was going to be, what is this money going to be spent on? I don't think it's very clear in the bill. It talks about, I was going to ask, how are we spending the $50,000? It's not real clear in the language of the bill exactly how this money is going to be sent. So uh, again, I appreciate the uh, discussion that we've had, but I just don't believe that uh, this is something that's needed. Textbook companies are making millions of dollars. They're knocking on college doors to get in with their product, and uh, I'm not sure we need to assist. Thank you. Further discussion on the amendment, Senator Dreheim. Seeing no further discussion on the amendment, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Members, we're back on Senate File 2415. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will give Senate File 2415 its third reading. Senate File Number 2415, a bill for an act relating to higher education. Third reading. Final discussion on Senate File 2415, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. President. Um, just like to say I appreciate uh, the last several weeks that we've been working on the Higher Education Committee, uh, working with Senator Anderson. Uh, I think we found a lot of places where we agree, and we continue to work on some areas that we disagree. I'd just like to make a, a few comments about the bill in general. I think when I, uh, I've been on the Higher Ed Committee now, I think for eight years, seven years, and I always look at what we're doing with the big three. The big three, as I see it, is the Minnesota Grant Program, the University of Minnesota, and then the Minnesota State System, because that's where the majority of our dollars have been spent over the years. So let's take a look at each one of those. If you look at the Minnesota State Grant Program, there are some real positive things in the Senate bill. One of the, the things that I'd really like to point to is that it there are some definite positive changes in the family and student uh, financial uh, amount that they are to be uh, paid for education. Uh, I think that that's allowing greater accessibility to the state grant program for more families, more individuals, and that's good. And we're actually increasing that by 5.9 percent, uh, $23.4 million. When you look at the University of Minnesota, you find what's our breakdown on uh, tuition. If you look at the total cost to run the University of Minnesota, 59 percent of that cost comes from tuition, 41 percent comes from the legislature. I think Senator Latz and others have commented that we've really disinvested over the years. To show this, 20 years ago, Minnesota, compared to other states, we were seven, we were actually nine percentage points above the average expenditure as a state when comparing ourselves with the other states. Nine percent above the average. Right now, we're five percent below. So we have really disinvested. 
And so why is it that 50.9% of the total cost to run the University of Minnesota system is in tuition? It's because we've disinvested as a legislature. This year, our increase for the University of Minnesota is 1.88%, or $28.5 million. That doesn't even take care of any type of cost of living. If you look at Minnesota State, and if you look at what their portion of tuition to run the system is, it's 50.9%. And 49.1% comes from the state allocation. It's a little bit better than the University of Minnesota. The increase this year for Minnesota State is 3.27% or $46.9 million. I think the one thing, again, to point out is, again, we've disinvested in higher education. We're five percentage points below the average expenditure amongst the states. The other thing that I think it's important, in statute, in statute, we are required as a legislature to pay for 67% of the tuition costs. We're not even coming close to that. Again, we've disinvested in education. This is the last comment on the online tuition issue. I think we're really taking a premature vote on this issue. I would hope that in the conference committee we can spend more time. I've heard uh, Senator Dreheim talk about the Georgia. What's happening in Georgia? Well, that's the complete Georgia college plan. They've got an attainment goal that they are trying to reach. They're investing more in education, and they're spending a lot of money from lottery sales for higher education. Senator Chamberlain, thank you. Uh, the first two years are also free in Georgia. They're doing that because they need more people with skills, four-year degrees, two-year degrees, certificates, licenses, and so on. Senator Chamberlain made the comment, let's have a serious conversation. We really have not had a serious conversation about this issue. Senator Dreheim made the comment, well, I hadn't seen that chart before today. And I asked myself some questions about who's taking these online courses. Are these people that are doing it for convenience? Are these people that are taking customized training courses that their corporations have put together so they can become better employees? We really have no idea. I would guess that there's some people that are willing to pay additional costs just for the convenience of staying at home, maybe in your pajamas, and taking the course. I do know because I did teach an online course a few years ago that you become a 24-7 instructor because you have people at 11 o'clock at night that are on their computer and they're asking questions or they're turning in a paper and you have people at 7 o'clock in the morning that are doing the same thing and throughout the day. So let's do a little bit more study. Let's find out a little bit more about who's taking the courses what are other states doing? Are we out of line? I also think we need to have a response from the University of Minnesota. We really haven't had uh, an in-depth response from the Minnesota state system. So I really think we need to take a step back on this whole online tuition issue. $65 million is a big hole, I think, a lot of us understand that, but we also understand that the rising cost of tuition is creating a crisis in our country, a crisis in our state. So with that, I'd just uh, like to say uh, thanks for the people that are on the committee and thank you to all those uh, support people. And I'm hoping that through the conference committee that we can make a, a few other changes and have more discussion and maybe slow down the discussion on the online tuition issue. So thank you, Mr. President.
Final discussion on the bill, Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first, uh, despite some of the very sharp disagreements we have on a few policy provisions, I'd like to say a warm word about how I thought the committee was conducted in a very open manner, giving a lot of opportunity for discussion, and further discussion was prompted. I thought the chair handled that uh, fabulously. And I really appreciate uh, each member on both sides of the aisle on that committee because there was a lot of real thoughtful discussion that I think for the most part you know, was concerned about how do we make a better uh, higher education system. And I think there's some ideological disagreements there about how funding works and what our responsibilities are and maybe what it looks like. But uh, I really did appreciate a fairly robust committee and robust discussion and I thought was really thoughtful and, and hopefully, you know, kind of how I hope this place would work most of the time. So I, I appreciate that and my hat's off to Senator Anderson for that. Um, <clears throat> I want to create a little bit of connective tissue and I want us to think a little bit about when the average person's watching this uh, or learning about it or reading about it, how does what we do here actually result in uh, actually result in things that occur on the ground. Are we done? Good. Uh, the connected tissue is this. How are actions here and when we pass bills and we suggest policy changes and we set targets has a real impact that goes several ripple effects away. And, and if we want to think about what are we doing here today that might have, as Senator Little suggested, an effect on our kids and their kids, I'd like to take you back 50 years from now and have a discussion of what happened with my parents that led to this moment in many ways. In uh, 1966, my dad enrolled in uh, Morehead State College at the time, and in 1968, my mom enrolled in Morehead State College. Now, the previous year, Governor Rolog, uh, Sen <laughs> Senate Majority Leader John Swack, and Speaker Lloyd Duxbury uh, really proposed a budget that continued a long tradition of investing in uh, higher education, investing in Minnesota's well-being, investing in our future. I want to thank those folks back then for having the foresight and the investment. And I want to thank the taxpayers going back to statehood who saw higher education and K-12, now E-12 education as being an important priority because it was an investment. It was an investment in our state and it was an investment in our future. You know, uh, <clears throat> The story that I, I think fits with my family is kind of a classic story I think a lot of families in Minnesota have. Uh, my dad uh, moved off the farm uh, as his father had passed away and his brother took over the farm and he was the first person uh, to kind of move to the city and he went to college, uh, much to, if he's embarrassed that I tell you this, but he was chasing a girl from his hometown at the time uh, and uh, followed her to the school and went to college. And, and uh, my mom was a transplant from California to Barrett, Minnesota, where uh, my dad and my mom met. And uh, she followed him after uh, they met and hung out and started dating and uh, uh, went to Morehead State University just a few years later. <clears throat> the reality is, is that time they took there and the degree they got, some of the very first, on my dad's side, the absolute first higher education degree. Norwegian immigrants that had emigrated two generations before that moved into the state, that had uh, just looking for some land and an opportunity to feed their family and maybe make a little bit of money and have some prosperity, culminated in the next step of that dream where their one of their kids went on to college and got a degree. Uh, my dad had a long career in manufacturing, uh, farm, farm implement machinery, that kind of stuff. Uh, my mom has worked in health systems for years, uh, became the first person in our family to have an advanced degree. Their experience, the investment made by Minnesotans years ago, culminated in an opportunity for my parents, not unlike many Minnesotans at that time, coming off of a more rural situation, getting a chance, an opportunity to go on and have a higher education, have greater opportunity. It's undoubted that part of my career today, not only as someone with an advanced degree, but as a college professor and even a state senator, is in part due to the decisions they made back in 66, which were in part due to the decisions made by taxpayers and politicians generations before that. You know, just three generations ago, my family was just farmers and trappers. That's all they did. Some of my family lived on the back corner of the farm, uh, farm lot, and they, all they did was trap for a living. You know, and now, three generations later, uh, my family gets to be business owners, 
In small town, parts, parts of small towns in Minnesota, they get to be, uh, like myself, college professors. My dad gets to be retired and can enjoy a modest, uh, a modest life as a retired person. My mom continues to work and is a, 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 a consultant working in healthcare leadership. It, it, we're blessed with that opportunity because Minnesota and the people of Minnesota made that investment. And just because, uh, much like my family is able to do, many families were able to take advantage of that. That's what investing in higher education does for Minnesota. It creates that kind of opportunity. And at the risk of sounding cheesy, I talk about this in my intercultural class. I'm not big on the American exceptionalism. I'm not sure that's the direction it's a good place to head. But I will tell you there's one area where I think America is quite exceptional. Uh, really the first country, or government on the planet, that said, you know what? You have the right not only to life and liberty, but you have the right to pursue happiness, whatever that means to you. And I think the investment Minnesota makes is right in line with that concept. So what does that mean when we look past our, our state? What does that mean when we look and compare ourselves to other states? Now, I'm sure, much to your chagrin, you can't forget the speech I gave a couple of years ago talking about how Minnesota, I, I'm big on Minnesota exceptionalism, let's be clear about that, and how great Minnesota is. Back then, I quoted a US News and World Report that had 60 rubrics that judged the states, and we were in the top five. Well, they came out with another report, folks, and now it's 75 rubrics, and we're number two behind Iowa, which I think is embarrassing, but we'll get to that another time. <clears throat> 75 measures, and we're number two, ranking really high in almost every rubric they could come up with. That's not an accident. That's a function of a state that made a solid commitment to investing in itself, period. That's what's important. That's why I think that I'm so passionate about higher education, because nothing sets us up more for the future than people who have a, a place to live that's good, an environment that's solid that they can live in that's safe, and an opportunity to better themselves. Whether it's going to be an HVAC technician, it's going to be a, a, a welder, a philosopher, a lawyer, or a doctor. Those opportunities are there. And here's the deal. They're there for a price that they can afford. The tuition rate <laughs> back in uh, 1966 was astoundingly low, but then again, it didn't cost as much to live. We've got to make sure we understand that. And so half of the argument my friends across the aisle make, I think it really resonates with me. I do think that there should be a benefit that helps people go to school so it's affordable, that only benefits us, that only raises our tax base, that only raises the standard of living for our constituents, that makes them more aware, more active participants and more active citizens in our, in our society. That's important. So why do I tell this story? Because unfortunately, this particular bill continues a recent tradition we have of uh, setting back higher education. It just doesn't do what we need it to do. Now, I don't think it's because Chair Anderson had this decision to set back higher education. I think he did the best he could with what he had within the confines of what his caucus handed him. I, I really believe that. I think he did the best he could with what he had. Unfortunately, and I think that I've said this before, but I want to be clear, that shortcoming isn't necessarily a partisan shortcoming. Because not that long ago we were in charge, and I don't feel like we did as much more as we could have done either. We, excuse me, we didn't do as much as we could have done either. The problem we have is that this bill punishes the students in the short run, and ultimately, based on how I explained it a few seconds ago, punishes the state in the long run. And that's the problem. It's short-sighted. The not supporting the, uh, uh, not supporting our schools where we need to can become short-sighted for us in the long run in the health of our state. I want to walk you through a few parts of the bill that really illustrate this for me. The $100, $100 million in additional funding is a bit, well, it's accurate and it's not. Is it $100 million more than we spent last time? Yes. But I've used this example, and I'm going to continue using it because it's such a great way to explain this. If a pencil in 2018 cost 10 cents, and a pencil in 2020 cost 12 cents, and we give you 11 cents to buy that pencil, two things are true. One, we did give you more money to buy the pencil. Two, we cut your buying power. Those two things are true. They don't seem like they could be true, but they are. And so we have to ask ourselves some questions. This particular budget, with $100 million additional funding, based on the most conservative estimate of inflation, falls short about $23 million just to match inflation. 
on the most conservative estimate. And you're right, we should try to figure out why is inflation for higher education so much higher than, than regular inflation. I think that's an important thing we should look at. This budget is a continuation of the disinvestment in higher education that we've been seeing for years, going back to the 60s in terms of a percentage of the whole budget, going back to the 90s in terms of really flipping the student to tuition ratio. Now, I will say to our credit, there is a little bit of ray of sunshine that we bought back and got some of that min state tuition back. We're not quite where we need to be, but we're getting there, and that's a nice start. Let's start with the state grant program. We increased the state grant program in this bill by, I think it's, I think, and correct, I could have the numbers wrong, but I think it's $23 million. What that will do is affect is it will create, it's more than 20? Yeah, $23 million, right. Um, it will create so there's more money going to the student per semester through the state grant program. And while on its face that sounds nice, but you can't consider that in a vacuum. You have to put it against what the tuition cost will be, right? And if we don't fund at the level we need to, tuition costs will outpace the amount gained from the state grant program. It's like a snake eating its own tail. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. If we're going to invest money, we should invest money in the schools to keep tuition low. And this tuition control thing is well intended. Again, like I said, I don't necessarily disagree that the tuition is something we, don't, we want to freeze. We do. We want to freeze. We want to lower it if we can. But when we do it by sacrificing other parts of the school, sacrificing other parts of the academic experience, sacrificing our priorities in education, that doesn't help. Remember how I said we're ranked in the top? Education is one of those areas. We continue to cut at the bone and the meat of education. We're not going to be ranked that high there anymore. We're not going to have an engaged citizen. We're not citizenry. We're not going to have higher voter turnout. We're not going to have more civic engagement. We're not going to have a place Fortune 500 companies want to do business. So we've got to be really thought about that. You know, we had some students that came when the bill was offered to, to freeze tuition completely. And those students gave very compelling stories. I was moved by them. I thought they were really important. Stories about how they're barely able to make it through to college. And if we raise tuition, that might just be the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think that's compelling. The problem is, is that in that conversation, it was implied, in my opinion, that the problem was the university system and the tuition, like they were the villains in this scenario. I think Senator Latz made that very clear. They're not, or at least not entirely that we have a certain responsibility here, too. We can't freeze tuition if we're also going to cut the quality of our educational system. We have to find a balance to that. We have to re-engage in our responsibilities there. Now, by the time it came to the floor, to the credit of the chair, he, he changed the language to 2% and 1%, 2% in the first year cap of tuition increase and 1% in the second year. I think that's a compromise moving in the right direction, and I really sincerely appreciate that. I hope in conference committee we can find something that works that doesn't harm the schools while also helping the students. I want to find that sweet spot. I think that's important. If we short fund higher education, we are just simply short funding our future. That's just the reality we're living in. If we short fund higher education, we're short funding our future. Now, there's no doubt, and I don't deny the fact that I'm a bit of a homer for higher education because that's the business I live in, the business I work in. But I didn't pick that trade because I was trying to make money. Nobody gets rich in higher education, at least not as a faculty. I chose that because it's an opportunity to make the world a better place, and somebody long ago gave me that opportunity by empowering me when I was not a good student. And that's now my burden and responsibility to take to all the students that I find, especially in the community college level, where they come back unsure about their skills, unsure about whether they should be there, unsure if they can survive or succeed in this environment. And my job is to get them so they do. So when I say we short fund higher education, we're short funding that moment that helps those students find their way whether it's just going to be a two-year degree, going on to a four-year degree, or they want to go on to be a doctor. We have to be really mindful about that. And when I believe that the opposing, or excuse me, the party on the other side of the aisle, my friends across the aisle, are ready to have that discussion, I will embrace it in open arms. And you know what? Maybe there is reason to cut when that happens. Maybe we'll uncover things that shows there's some problems we got to fix. I want to do that. But the motive has got to be keeping that education system strong, 
because it keeps our economy strong and it keeps the state strong. And for that reason, I can't support the bill in its current form. I, I hope that we see it in conference committee. I do believe that our, my friends across the aisle on this committee are walking in with the best of intentions, and I really look forward to seeing what comes out of conference and really look forward to hopefully voting for a bill that we can all get behind. That sure, there'll be parts I don't like, there'll be parts they don't like, but we find some middle ground that makes it better. That's the goal. Are we making the system better with our bill? Right now, we're not. I hope that we get there. Thank you for your time. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. When I heard Senator Anderson speaking earlier, I think he used the exact phrase, this is about the students. This is about the students. And there have been a lot of talk about how we're going to help the students in here with the free textbooks, with the tuition caps, with the debate we had earlier about how we're going to bring down the cost of online education. But I think fundamentally those seem to be more distractions than big picture items. They're important to try and save money in smaller ways, but the big picture we ought to be looking at at higher education is what kind of a commitment we're going to make to funding. The funding for the state grants program, the funding for the MinSKU system, the funding for the University of Minnesota. That's what the students deserve, not little changes around the corners, but looking at the big numbers. And what I'm troubled by is the fact that the targets given in this bill were 100 million. That's less than a third of the targets the House have. And I know people say, well, we can't match that. We don't have the money. It's not in the targets. And the trouble I have with that is Senator Anderson, I understand. People will say you did a good job given the targets. It's always a good job given the targets, as if those targets are some immutable reality. We can't change it. That's just the way they are. They were handed down on stone tablets from some divine being. Well, this isn't Charlton Heston, and it's not the Ten Commandments. These are targets. They're set by people in here, and we can change them. But we say, these are the ones we have. This is all we can have on this. And so what we end up with is an investment in higher education that doesn't reflect what we say we want to do, what we say we care about kids. I think it's state policy, state law says our goal is to spend two-thirds of the cost of public higher education in the state. I think it actually uses the percentage, 67% in the statute that that's what we want to commit. The students will have one-third of the burden, but we're going to pay for two-thirds of it. And what we've done, we keep slipping, and it's been slipping over many years, but this bill isn't helping it. This is making it worse. We're down to about 40% of the funding now. And somehow, maybe we can magically buy online tuition cheaper or cheaper textbooks or other things. Somehow, we're going to make it better for the students. But in 1968, a student going to the University of Minnesota had to work 44 hours, had to work six hours a week at the minimum wage in order to pay their university tuition and fees. A few years ago, it was 44 hours at the minimum wage of several years ago to pay tuition and fees. In other words, back in a generation or two ago, students could work part-time and pay their fees. Now, every one of us knows students who are deep in debt and struggling to pay those loans back. If we were serious about this, that 67% that we have in statute might be something we'd fulfill. I'm disappointed, again, the targets are not something that we can't change. The targets are something that are set in this chamber by members of this chamber. And we can move forward and change them and invest more realistically in this. I think the House has done a much better job. We're not going to get back to 67 percent today, but we could at least be moving in the right direction. I hope we take that seriously as we move forward and don't count on hiding behind targets that you yourself set and then say, but that's all we can do because that's what we were given. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Anderson. 
Well, thank you, Madam, Mr. President, and, and, and members. I think I'll just kind of finish up where I started. Uh, members, this, this bill leverages $100 million in new investments to protect students and families from increased costs. By boosting scholarship and grant funds, which is absolutely critical, this workforce scholarship program is a game changer when it comes to workforce shortage in our state. Um, we limit tuition increase. We bolster successful programs that meet those workforce needs. We encourage critical public-private partnerships and increase accountability for our public higher education systems. This bill is a product of the good work and healthy conversations on big issues um, that we've had in, in committee this, this session. And I do want to thank uh, my colleagues on the committee. I want to thank uh, Senator Claussen. Uh, we've established a good working relationship and have had really good conversations, and I look forward to working with him and the other members going forward. Uh, Senator Isaacson, Senator Cohn, Senator Newton, and on our side, our Vice Chair, Senator Dreheim, Senator Abler, Senator Jensen, and uh, you, Mr. President. We certainly don't always agree on all the issues, but I do know that each of our members, members shares the desire for a healthy and strong higher education for all students, families, and the future of Minnesota. And it's an honor to serve on this committee with each of you. I want to just take a quick moment. Uh, I know we need to get to public safety as well. I want to give a very special thank you to our committee staff. Uh, Tricia Elite, our committee administrator. Jason Fossum, who is uh, our committee administrator for the first two months of session. Ray, uh, Rachel Bakke, who is our committee legislative assistant. Um, Brittany Johnson, our, our Republican researcher, and Dana Elling, our Democrat researcher. Our nonpartisan staff, Joan White and Patrick Tobin. And our Senate pages, Max and Simon. I think Simon stepped out. But members, as we head into the conference committee, this is a strong bill that the Senate is putting students first. Members, with that starting point, I look forward to working with the House and the Governor to get us the best higher education bill possible for the people of Minnesota. And for today, members, I urge a green vote. Members, we're on final passage of Senate File 2415 as amended. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll. All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 38 ayes and 29 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, the next bill up for consideration is number 126 on general orders, Senate file 802, Senator Lim Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Senate File 802 is the Judiciary and Public Safety Omnibus Budget Bill. 
And I do want to make a little announcement before we get real heavy into this. Uh, I want to make sure everyone realizes I have not included policy-only language in this bill. It's been uh, a long-standing tradition of the Judiciary Committee to have bills that only reflect the finance aspects of public policy. Standalone bills, policy only language is not included in this. Uh, those bills are still active, but they will be considered later this session. I wanted to make sure that we begin to comply with the constitutional single subject rule. And if you have ever read the state constitution, we do have that, and lately it's been somewhat ignored. But members, this budget covers and totals approximately $2.38 billion of our division, and it covers public safety and access to our court system by funding core functions of government, and has a budget target of $25.34 million per biennium and with that, we have done our best to create a fiscal respo fiscally responsible budget. A priority of this budget is the security of our prisons and the safety of our correction officers. And it's very important considering the recent events in our correction system. As you may know, most of our budget is driven by staff costs. For example, people make up the services provided by courts. People are staffing our prisons. People are running the labs at the BCA. And our staff's health insurance costs have continued to go up, even with the additional costs paid for by employees. As I said before, in addition to covering employee health insurance increases for the biennium, this budget includes a total increase of $9.5 million for new correction officers, that's equivalent to 38 new positions in fiscal year 2020, 66 in fiscal year 2021, $2 million for security upgrades in fiscal year 20 and 21, with tails of $22.5 million in fiscal year 22 and 23 for both new officers and security improvements. To address these priorities and satisfy our budget target, we made uh, a hard decision. It wasn't a popular choice, but we are real reallocating some funds from the law enforcement training grants to pay for these additional prison guards. This bill also includes $340,000 for a federal disaster reimbursement for Rapidan Township that suffered a natural disaster but was uh, sought FEMA funding but was reneged by the federal government. The bill also provides funding to toughen penalties for sex offenders. The bill includes increased sentencing for those who produce or sell child pornography, and this will particularly affect repeat offenders or anyone who exploits a minor under the age of 13. Additional funding supports the repeal of the marital rape defense. The funding for this provision is in this bill. The language for the bill will be in House File 15 and will be considered later this session. This antiquated law, the, repeal, the marital rape defense, is limited to individuals from prosecuting their spouse or loved one for sexual assault. The bill enhances penalties and requires predatory offender registration for intrusion, surreptitious intrusion, if a person records a minor with sexual intent. New language clarifies that despite consent, a police officer may not engage in sexual conduct of any kind with anyone in their custody. To further protect children from exploitation, a 120-day cooling off period is included so that teachers and coaches or others known as, as a person in a position of authority may not enter a relationship with a recent student old enough to consent but not 18. Keeping Minnesotans safe is certainly our priority, but nevertheless, 
uh, this bill is before us. And I, oh, and we also have one other provision um, that I forgot to mention. There's a $300,000 anti-terrorism security grant for nonprofit faith-based organizations. Um, and we have done that before. We work in cooperation with Homeland Security. They uh, administrate the funding when it's sought. Uh, I believe I've covered most of the bill, Mr. President, and I'll stand for questions or discussion. Discussion on Senate File 802. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, this is one skinny public safety bill. Uh, this bill will, in fact, put more lives at risk. It's a pretend budget, and it's a cut budget in real terms for services and for the employees. Let me explain to you the ways in which I think this budget is morally deficient and fiscally farcical. It's only a $25 million increase over a $2.3 billion base. And there are no salary increases in here for our public servants. There are health insurance cost increases, but those aren't covered in the tails. There's a zero tails for them. That's just a fiscal nonsense. We all know that there are going to be tails for the health insurance increases in here, but our budget shows zero. This budget will result in net cuts to the number of correctional officers in our prisons. Now, let me say that again, because on the face of it, there's money that is supposedly intended to increase the number of correctional officers so that we don't have more correctional officers die in our prisons. But in effect, with this bill, there will be a net cut of correctional officers in our prisons. The governor's budget has funding for 120 net new guards, plus 47 support staff, for a total of 167 staff, and with technology improvements, $36.5 million budget cost. The Senate projects 38 new guards, total staff of 66 for $9.5 million in the budget. Now, First of all, our correctional agency, the Commissioner of Corrections, says they need 120 guards. Actually, they need more, but they project that they can fill 120 positions in this biennium. And despite the arguments that some have tried to make that they don't have the ability to recruit and train sufficient staff to fill those needs, they have actually, at the Department of Corrections, made some changes in their recruitment and training processes uh, so that they um, are on pace now uh, to keep up with that projected 120 and believe they can fill those positions. Now, what this budget does not cover, and here's why this is a net loss in correctional officers, because this budget does not cover the mandatory cost of providing health care for our offenders. The courts have made clear that the prisons have no option here of not providing adequate health care for the offenders who are in their care because they are living in the prisons under the control and direction of the state of Minnesota. The prisoners have no options to go somewhere else for their health care. They have to be provided their health care by our correction system. Yet. This budget does not provide the funds to provide that care. We know there are going to be increased costs in health care, which means the department is going to have to take that money out of other parts of the budget. That means people. As the chairman already indicated, most of this budget is about people. That's where the money is going to have to come from to cover offender health care. That means cuts in staffing. There are also anticipated and negotiated salary increases, which are going to take effect July 1st. They aren't funded in this budget either. 
They aren't funded in this budget, but they're going to have to be paid for. Where's that money going to come from? Cuts in other parts of the budget, which is to say cuts in personnel, which means fewer correctional officers, not more. The Department of, of Corrections projects the net loss of correctional officers of 78 full-time equivalents in fiscal year 20 and 119 fiscal year equivalents addition in fiscal year 21. And in the tail years, out in 23-24, a net loss of 195 correctional officers. Now, if we don't have enough correctional officers right now in the facilities to make sure that the officers go to work in the morning and leave at the end of the day to go home to their families because they're running staff too thin, because they only have one officer to watch out or watch over the prisoners when they're in their facilities, when they're transferring from one program to another, when they don't have enough officers there now. And they say they need 120 more. And this budget is going to cut almost 200 officers from the, budget, from the correctional staff. It's going in the opposite direction of officer safety. When you look out to 23-24 with 195 additional losses, that's the equivalent of the entire operating cost for the state correctional facility in Red Wing. It's also the equivalent of all of the chemical dependency and sex offender treatment provided in the state correctional system. All of it. As some of the correctional officers testified at the Judiciary Committee hearing. They need bodies in the correctional system so they can go home safely. This bill increases their risk of not going home safely or not going home at all. In addition, there is no money for improved prison security. The governor funds $7.7 .7 million for that. There is no money for the disaster contingency account. Just none. It's funded with another contingency. If in the contingency that there's money left over when projections come in down the road in the fall sometime, if we have more money coming in than we end up budgeting for this session, only then will there be a backfill to the disaster contingency account. If there are disasters between now and then, or if there's not enough to backfill the disaster contingency account, then the communities of every member of this Senate are going to be lagging in getting reimbursed for the costs of their emergencies. All of our communities that experience an emergency, whether it's summer tornadoes or additional flooding, or whatever it happens to be, are going to suffer because this budget does not put any money actually into the disaster contingency account until at least next fall, and maybe not even enough then. The courts. <clears throat> the courts specifically asked for enough money so they can maintain the, treat the specialty courts faced dealing with treatment, chemical dependency treatment. This budget doesn't provide it. We've had a lot of conversations in this body about the opioid crisis in Minnesota. Those addicts are showing up in our court system, and the best equipped courts to deal with that are the specialty treatment courts. Yet this budget does not provide the funding to be able to maintain and increase the amount of treatment courts that are available, which means there are going to be fewer addicts opioid addicts that are going to get successful treatment, and we're putting more of them at risk as a result of that. Our state is constitutionally mandated to provide guardians ad litem for children who are in the court system. Children, not the adults, not their parents. Children who are in the court system. Yet right now, many of those children are going through the court system alone without anyone there to watch out for their best interests. This is constitutionally mandated, yet this budget 
does not provide the funding for adequate staff to meet that mandate. Kids will continue to go through the court system, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds going through the court system alone. There is no funding in this budget to treat domestic violence perpetrators. No treatment, no prevention means more victims of domestic assault in our communities. There's no money in this budget for telephone CPR training for the 911 operators. And we heard in committee an actual recording of a 911 operator that was giving CPR advice to a caller who was dealing with an emergency situation for a person who had fallen ill. But not all 911 operators have that skill. They requested funding to learn that training so that they could provide that assistance and save lives over the phone when every second counts for someone who's having a heart attack or a stroke. No money in this bill for that. Our public defender system is, is substantially shortchanged here. This, again, constitutionally mandated services for criminal defendants. The whole criminal justice system suffers when there are insufficient public defenders in the system because everyone's waiting around for the PDs to show up to handle the cases. Their caseloads are among the worst in the nation. They came in with a very reasonable request. The governor funded it. No additional money in this budget to provide additional public defenders. The Department of Public Safety outlined several areas where they need specific help as well. For example, the currently existing school safety center, which provides consultation advice to our school districts all around the state on how to protect their facilities, the students in our K-12 system from outside attack. They provide a lot of services, but the demand has increased quite substantially just in the last couple of years. All they're asking for is two additional FTEs to consult with schools, but there's no funding here for them. The Department of Public Safety has an aging and obsolete and slow and unstable automated fingerprint system. It's in such bad shape that it's out of compliance with the Federal Bureau of Investigation's requirements. The system is obsolete. There are delays in running fingerprints from crime scenes. There are matches that aren't being made because the system isn't capable of having all the information to, to make those matches. There are delays in identifying and capturing suspects or, on the flip side, they're holding innocent people in custody when they think they have a suspect and are waiting to get fingerprint results to find out if the person they have is the right person. Or worse, they're charging can charge and convict the wrong people because they don't have good or prompt fingerprint data. As the Department of Public Safety has told us, this compromises their crime-solving capabilities and leaves predators at large. And members, you have on your desk a letter from the Commissioner of Public Safety, as you have a letter from the Commissioner of Corrections that also details some of this information. The Department of Public Safety is requiring additional funds for improved cybersecurity. This is where it's at, members. This is the bottom line. Cybersecurity will affect all of us. They need some attention and some funding, and this, there's no money in this budget to help them with those additional requirements. They sought additional money to do better investigations regarding vulnerable adult and sexual assault cases. No money, no additional money in this budget for that either. And they've informed me that because Senator Rosen's bill is only half funded with the opioid, dealing with the opioid crisis, the Department of Public Safety doesn't have sufficient funds to make up the difference. There's no funding here for that either. The Peace Officer Training Fund is suffering a $6 million cut in this bill. That means less training for our officers. The Department of Human Rights, which helps businesses understand how to comply with our anti-discrimination laws in Minnesota and helps uh, people who believe they've been discriminated against 
uh, get an investigation and find out if they have been discriminated against. They've asked for four new regional offices around the state so they can bring their services closer to the people that they're helping. No additional funding for the Human Rights Department here. That means more workers suffering discrimination without recourse and more businesses making errors in the way they're handling situations, exposing them to unnecessary liability. There's no money at all in this bill for the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women's Task Force. There's no money at all in this bill for the Department of Corrections Ombudsperson to help reduce violence in our prisons. There's no money in this bill at all for expanded juvenile detention alternatives to reduce crime and lower prison costs. There is no increase for civil legal services. They turn away two out of three people who are actually financially qualified for their services. Yet they are left to fend for themselves in the legal system. These are people facing landlord-tenant issues, custody battles, other family law issues, immigration issues. They all qualify for civil legal services, but the agencies cannot support them. And in our judiciary system, an independent branch of government, not only do we not help them with their treatment court funding issues, we don't help them hardly at all with any funding. Because like the other agencies, they are heavily dependent on the people. This bill, frankly, is a slap in the face to the state Supreme Court, to the judges, to the district courts uh, that they supervise and manage, and that most of our constituents have direct if they have any involvement in the court system, civil or criminal, that's where they see it. And we are somehow expecting our judicial employees, like all of the other employees in this budget, to work without any pay increase. Now, how can this be so if, as the GOP often states, there's a $1 billion surplus in our state coffers? Of course, I pointed out earlier that now I'm a bit confused whether the state's broke or whether there's a surplus that needs to be somehow not put back into maintaining our services in the state, but doing other things. I mean, the fact is, the $1 billion revenue over cost number that we're dealing with that's in budget, if you account for inflation, that's what simply maintain our current level of services. But inflation includes inflation in the costs of our people that deliver these services to Minnesotans. So I wonder if Senator Limmer will yield for a question or two. Senator Limmer will yield. Senator Lance. Senator Limmer, uh, do you feel that there is sufficient funding in this bill for correctional officer hiring? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Lance, uh, in light of the target that we have uh, and recognizing a total of 104 correction officers at this time and recognizing the 80 positions, 40 of which are filled already at least by last count uh, by my discussion with the commissioner uh, would total about 184. Uh, I believe we're well on our way to cover that. Uh, it, in light of 80 officers or 80 vacancies for over a year that haven't been filled, I'm somewhat concerned that the Corrections Department would be able to fill the 80 this past year as well as the new 104 positions that we have already scheduled in this bill. I believe that the timeline would convince me that I would hope that the department would fill these positions in a short period of time. Senator Lass. So, so, Mr. President, I mean, the big caveat here uh, was in light of the target, um, and the commissioner answered these questions at Judiciary Committee hearings, um, that they firmly believe they've got the resources and the ability to fill all of the positions, the 120 positions that they are asking for. That's not funded in this bill. Uh, we have some amendments, Mr. Chairman, to try to remedy some of the deficiencies uh, in this bill. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to offer the A34 amendment. Senator Latz offers the A34 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Latz moves to amend Senate file number 802 as follows, page 13 after line 15 insert. This is the A34 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, the A34 amendment would transfer $5 million out of the surplus existing in the Minnesota Correctional Industries Revolving Fund into the state's general fund as a one-time transfer. Uh, we uh, have been provided with fiscal projections by of the department. This is uh, a fund which is a standalone fund. Um, it is uh, uh, it's filled by the revenues from the uh, correctional industries, MinCor, as we call it. Um, and right now, uh, they have uh, funds in there that are not projected uh, for a use in the upcoming uh, uh, immediate period of time, and we'd like to put it. To good use. Uh, so this amendment would give us an opportunity uh, to provide uh, some uh, funding for some of the areas where we are deficient um, in uh, this bill. To the amendment, Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President Portobardo. Uh, Senator Rosen, for what reason do you rise? I would rule that this amendment is out of order under the Rule 7.4, which states the amount of a tax expenditure by reducing appropriations, transfers, or revenues to an agency that is not in the bill as it was reported to the floor of the Senate. An amendment to an omnibus appropriation or tax bill that is a Senate file or unofficial grossman of a House file is out of order. Senator Rosen, uh, just so I'm clear, under 7.4, which number are you referring to? Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. President. It would be paragraph four, which I just read. Members' advice on the point of order? Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, Rule 7.4, paragraph four, deals with tax expenditures. Uh, the 834 amendment has nothing to do with tax expenditures. Mr. President. Uh, Senator Rosen. My apologies. It is one, the increase in the appropriations from a fund for a fiscal biennium without a corresponding increase in net revenue compared to the bill that was reported to the floor of the Senate. Further advice, members? Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, um, the amendment itself is self funding because it's coming out of a fund that is different than uh, the judiciary budget that we have before us. Uh, so there are sufficient funds in that account. Um, it's, that's an account that is not filled by our general fund. Uh, it's filled by revenues from uh, the prison industry's operations. Many of those lines are shut down right now. Um, so uh, the need for having the money in that account is simply not there um, at the moment. Um, so uh, paragraph one would not apply in this case to this particular account.
Mr. President. Further advice, Senator Latz. I would further add that it's my understanding and the way it's been uh, handled in the past in the Senate is that paragraph one is referring only to funds that are within the, uh, um, the budget bill that we are considering on the floor of the Senate. So bringing in revenues from an outside source uh, would not run afoul of this paragraph. Mr. Further President, advice, Senator Benson. I impose a call of the Senate. The Senate is under call. Mr. President. Senator Benson. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the sergeant at arms be instructed to bring in absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails and the sergeant at arms will bring in the absent members. Members, I rule that the point of order is well taken and the amendment is out of order. Further advice or further discussion on Senate File 802, Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, I have the A48 amendment. Senator Latz offers the A48 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Latz moves to amend Senate file number 802 as follows, page 10, line 25, delete. This is the A48 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, the A48 amendment would make a small amount of the existing uh, police training fund available uh, to be used for other uh, expenditures. Um, which I anticipate there will be some requests for. Discussion on the LATS A48 amendment. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would like to offer an amendment to the amendment. I have uh, a36. Senator <laughs> Torres Ray offers the A36 amendment to the amendment. Okay, sorry, it's A51. Okay, Senator Torres Ray offers the A51 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. The Secretary, hold on, Senator Torres Ray. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Torres Ray moves to amend the LATS amendment to Senate File 802 as follows, page one after line one, insert. This is the A51 amendment. To the amendment to the amendment, Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members and Senator Limmer, as you know, in committee, I ask for your support to create a task force that will provide recommendations to address violence against our Native women and girls in Minnesota. This proposal has received significant support, not just in the House,
but also in the Senate. I believe it is very important that I present to you some of the reasons for why this proposal has received significant support in our community. Native women are victims of violence at a rate of two and a half times greater than that of any other population in our country. One in three Native women will be raped in her lifetime. Four in five women will be victims of a violent assault. And in some regions in Minnesota, members, Native women are murdered at more than 10 times the national average. More than 40% of Native children experience two or more acts of violence by the age of 18. Members, I believe that we cannot continue to ignore our Indigenous women. There are many Indigenous women who have fallen through the cracks of history into a broken legal system that has disregarded the rights and the rights of the children, of their children for decades. And I would like to tell you tonight, members, that this is just a very small part of the tragic story. The most difficult part of this story is that most cases are unsolved cases of missing indigenous women. The many indigenous women and girls that we actually don't know about. These statistics only tell part of the story, but they fail to account for the devastating impact that this violence has on survivors, on Indian families, on native communi communities, and Indian nations themselves. Senator Limmer, members of the committee, and members, I believe we have the obligation to resolve this issue. We need an accurate database that identify Native women. We can't continue to pretend that these women are invisible. Members, I ask for your support of this amendment. We need to address the high rate of violence against Indigenous women in our state and our nation. We need to find ways to fill gaps in law enforcement between tribes, municipal and federal authorities. The task force that we propose to create will help us find the appropriate methods to track and collect data and then provide the measures necessary to reduce and address violence against women. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. President. Members to the A51 amendment to the A48 amendment. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Torres Ray, um, I know that this has been a bill that you have had a lot of compassion about and that you're very dedicated to it. You've been working on this project for a number of years now, uh, I think maybe three or four, maybe even longer than that. Um, you and I discussed my commitment to you during the process as we get, get going toward the end of the session and how uh, I reminded you that I'm a co-author on your bill and that um, I believe that this is um, a noble issue that we should address. Uh, as many of our members might know, this was included in the last judiciary bill. It was included once it got folded into the big omnibus bill that we voted on a few years ago, or two, just last year. And uh, nevertheless, uh, I did commit to you, Senator Torres Ray, that I would do everything I could do to make this a priority as we went forward with negotiations with the other body. Your bill, or I'm sorry, your amendment to the amendment uh, uses money from the post board. And uh, I just hope that the members realize that the post board is beginning to lose funds. Funds that are already being lost due to the fact that the money comes from speeding tickets and other uh, smaller fines in our criminal justice system 
and that it's due to judges not imposing full fines, we're beginning to have a deficit in the post board. But despite that, uh, I believe that this, the issue that Senator Torres Ray has brought forward is one that has long been uh, neglected. I think it's vitally important for us to consider the Task Force on Missing and Murdered Ind Indigenous Women Task Force. This is a bill, or this amendment, this proposal here is limited to the financial uh, moving around of certain budgets, but with a uh, clear understanding that our post board is now being further depleted. Uh, I am concerned about that, but nevertheless, I believe that the time is now to decide and commit this Senate to this particular task force, and I accept this amendment as a friendly amendment. Further discussion on the amendment, to the amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails and the, uh, the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Members, we're back on the A48 amendment as amended. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the A50 amendment to the amendment. Senator Clausen has the A50 amendment to the amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Clausen moves to amend the Lats amendment to Senate file number 802 as follows. Page 1 after line 1 insert. This is the A50 amendment. To the A50 amendment to the amendment, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the A50 amendment relates to the school safety center and would provide $250,000 each year for the Minnesota School Safety Center. Uh, I think we all know that school safety continues to be a major concern for parents, children, school personnel, and we as legislators. We all want our schools and our children to be safe. And during the 2018 legislative session, grant funding assisted schools to implement physical building safety improvements. And currently, there have been many school safety legislative initiatives introduced, including mandated school safety assessment policies and funding to purchase safety equipment. To implement safety policies and to ensure legislative resources are being properly directed to increase school safety requires consultation with knowledgeable sources. The Minnesota School Safety Center meets this need, serving as a resource to schools and communities at no charge to school districts. A little bit of history on the School Safety Center. It was created in 2007 by the legislature with the help of federal funding by the Minnesota Department of Public Safety and Division of Homeland Security. Unfortunately, federal funding expired in 2011 and the center was closed. The center, however, reopened in 2013 with legislative appropriate, appropriated funding. The center serves K-12 public, private, charter, and tribal schools as a resource to schools, law enforcement, public safety, emergency management personnel, and community partners. The center provides information, guidance, training, and technical assistance for best practices in all phases of safety school planning. The center coordinates prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery activities with federal, tribal, state, and local partners. There are currently three staff members with an ongoing appropriated budget of $405,000. This group of people, three people, have an appropriated budget of $405,000, and yet they reach out to 
over 250 schools annually throughout the state. The A50 amendment restores a staff position that was reduced during budget constraints and adds one additional staff position with a $250,000 annual appropriation. And I'd like to say this is a small appropriation when compared to the safety outcomes that will be achieved. And I have personal experience working with the School Safety Center when I was a high school principal. When I moved to our district office and one of the tasks that I had was to develop a school safety district program for over 28,000 students and over 30 buildings. The first group of people I met with was people from the School Safety Center. Some of the things that the School Safety Center provides for schools, they do multi-hazard emergency planning, they do threat assessment, they do active shooter, violent intruder response, lockdown procedures with various options, crisis communication, de-escalation uh, strategies, building access and visitor control, bomb threat responses, safe school facility assessments, and tabletop exercises involving a uh, number of people within the community. Senator Latz earlier had talked about a letter distributed by uh, Senator Latz from John Harrington, the Department of Public Safety Commissioner. And if you'll turn to that letter and look at the bottom, the commissioner specifically identified the School Safety Center as a significant concern not found in the judiciary bill. And to quote that, there is a groundswell of interest from local school districts in receiving technical assistance from the School Safety Center. Failing to fund two additional FTEs means the center is unable to meet the demand or implement the program imp improvements that have been requested by stakeholders. So again, to help ensure the safety of our children in our schools throughout the state, I'm asking for your support for the School Safety Center. Thank you. Discussion on the amendment to the amendment. Senator Nelson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I appreciate uh, the Senator's comments about school safety. It's clear that school safety is essential. We're focusing on that extensively uh, in this budget, in this legislative session. And indeed, children, every child, every parent needs to know that when their child goes to school and walks in those school doors, it is a safe and secure place. So for those who don't serve on the Education Committee and who might not know, because we haven't had our education bill before you yet, but we will, the Senate Education Bill takes school safety extremely seriously. Other than our top priority of $93 million of new money to the education formula, the second big priority in the bill you'll see before us is school safety. And so while I understand the desire to take a million dollars from one place and move it over to another place in the judiciary bill, the fact of the matter, members, is that there is 75, let me say that again, $75 million for comprehensive, broad-based school safety. So while I appreciate the amendment before us, my friends, it does far too little, and it is far too narrow. Uh, and so I would speak against this amendment, but we will be speaking uh, certainly uh, in favor of a much broader, much more extensive $75 million towards school safety. You'll be seeing that uh, in the next uh, few days when we have our education bill. And I'll just tell you a little bit about what some of those things can do. Uh, those school safety dollars 
can be used for things like school assessments, bulletproof glass, single point entry, security cameras. Those are just a few of the facility type things. Those school safety dollars can also be used for those important people costs that are in the schools that help keep the schools safe. Those are things like counselors, psychologists, social workers. Those all are the things that we should be focusing on. Not just a little sliver, not just a $1 million. We need to be looking at the broader picture of how we can best keep our kids safe. And believe me, it is more than a $1 million shuffle from one budget to the other. So again, school safety is key. It's necessary for students to learn. Maslow's hierarchy of needs shows us very clearly the base of that pyramid is safety before any other things uh, as far as learning can take place. And so that is what uh, we are proposing, a much broader, richer school safety proposal. So while I appreciate the focus on this, what we need is the broader, more comprehensive, better funded school safety package that we will be seeing soon on this floor, which I believe will be perhaps Monday. So members, uh, that's what we should be driving for, not just a little bit of shuffling between budgets today. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Nelson yield, please? Senator Nelson will yield. Senator Kent. Thank you. Um, I would ask Senator Nelson if uh, her $75 million in the education bill includes the half a million dollars um, that is recommended here for the uh, school safety center. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, Senator Kent. Uh, as I just described, the $75 million goes far beyond the school safety center that this amendment was trying to address. However, it addresses it in a very uh, broader, uh, a, a broader appeal, a broader uh, scope. Mr. President? Senator Kent. So I, I think what I heard in that answer is no, that, it, that this particular initiative is not included in the $75 million that um, the Senator Nelson was discussing is in the E-12 bill. And which is, I mean, I, we all support school safety. The proposal in the E-12 bill is important and needed. Those are important steps we need to take. But members, this is important too. Uh, the bang for the buck, if you will, by making this modest investment in this hugely valuable resource that is used by districts around our state, by b our school buildings, our principals, our administrators, throughout Minnesota, in all of our communities, this goes so far to help advance the cause of school safety. Because through this one office, with these few people who have the expertise and the understanding in this very specific area and are tasked as public servants of the state of Minnesota to provide this resource, this is what they do. This is what they've been doing, and this is what they need to keep doing more of. And as it is stated in Commissioner Harrington's letter, there is a groundswell of interest. This has been an ongoing issue, but there has been a groundswell of interest in these services, in receiving technical assistance. And so having these two additional FTEs, again, it is a modest investment for a very significant source of support for our schools around the state. I think this is very important, and I strongly su recommend supporting uh, the Clawson Amendment to the amendment. Further discussion, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, just to clarify, the uh, Safe and Secure Schools Bill can cover things like audits, but my fear is that the amendment before us, from what I understood, is to hire more people uh, in the public safety department. 
we don't need, we need uh, those safe and secure school features in our schools where the students are. We don't, I'm not so sure that we need to uh, expand bureaucratic uh, positions here in St. Paul. So uh, regardless though, let's be clear that the Safe and Secure Schools Bill uh, would cover those, is an it's a, would be an eligible use in uh, safe and secure schools. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. And I, I agree with Senator Nelson that Safe and uh, Secure Schools Bill is important. Providing uh, the financial resources is critical. But there's another piece of this, and that is the technical assistance of how do you use that money. She talked about security cameras, uh, Senator Nelson did. Uh, she talked about entrances. Well, where do you place those security cameras? What's the best exit routes for students when evacuating a building? What if an area is blocked? What other options do you have? Where do you post evacuation routes? What kind of drills do you run to ensure that if there is an emergency that you have the people in place to direct students so that you have a successful outcome? What about the entrance areas of your school? What has to be done? The, the Minnesota School Safety Center provides that expertise. They sit down with school personnel. They sit down with public law enforcement people. They'll sit down and do tabletop exercises with EMT personnel, school personnel, law enforcement. They'll advise schools on how to protect your building more securely from a physical standpoint, but beyond that, they will help, as I mentioned before, in evacuation procedures, where do students go, what do teachers do if you have an intruder in the building. Those are the critical things. Certainly financial assistance is needed, but then what do you do with the funds? You need to have someone there. These people are experienced that are with the School Safety Center. It's not a cost to the school districts. And I really encourage support for an organization that's been around a long time, has the trust of the school systems, the charter schools, the private schools, and travel schools around the state because they've worked with them. And they'll continue to work with them, hopefully, on a much more broader base if we can expand the ability for them to reach out to more people in more districts. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, would Senator Nelson yield for a question? Senator Nelson will yield. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Nelson, I listened carefully to your discussion about school safety and the number of dollars that you in your bill, the K-12 bill, have dedicated so far to that purpose. Um, and I can't help but make the comparison. When I'm looking at the school safety center of a half a million dollars over a biennium versus your figure of $75 million to have a comprehensive approach to school safety. And so in order to understand the scope and scale that you have uh, committed to, is could you tell me how many school districts in the state of Minnesota would that $75 million be applied to? Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Limmer, that's a great question because every school in our state needs to be safe. And so the 75 million, actually it's 80 million, five of that is for um, school-linked mental health, and we'll talk about that on another day. But the 75 million is for safe schools revenue, which includes safe schools aid and safe schools levy. And that is um, available 
and will be available uh, should this body pass, Senate File 7, that will be available to every school in the school district. And that's what we need to do. We need to make sure that we are providing the resources to protect and make sure that our students are safe in every school, not just a few. So, Senator Limmer, uh, every school in Minnesota will be eligible for those safe uh, and secure school resources. <clears throat> and of course, that would include our charter schools as well. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Senator Nelson, um, I don't remember quite off the top of my head how many school districts we have in the state of Minnesota, uh, but I know they're quite numerous. And then try and multiply that by all the number of our school buildings in each district. That becomes a considerable volume of properties as well as students within those buildings to take care of. I uh, notice that there's, I'm trying to determine how a half a million dollars will in any way reach the scope that your proposal will be reaching at this very same time. Um, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, I believe uh, there might be others that want to get involved in this discussion. But Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, Senator Senjum. Thank you, Mr. President. Just maybe a point of information, uh, and uh, in uh, conjunction with what Senator Limmer is saying, uh, this body may remember that uh, in the 2018 Capital Investment Committee bill, there was additional $25 million, which uh, uh, was dedicated to school safety, and which, as far as I know, is out the door and, and, and working uh, this evening. So just wanted to make the, the group aware of that. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and um, would the uh, author stand for a question? Uh, Ms. Senator Clausen. Senator, Senator Clausen will yield. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Clausen, uh, the dollars that you're moving around here are coming from the Minnesota Post Board training account, is that correct? Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President, and Senator Ingelbertson. Yes, that is correct. Senator Ingelbertson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Senator Clausen, for that. Members, if you look at the uh, if you look at the bill and if you look at the spreadsheet, you'll notice that the police officers' training actually has been trimmed back this year. And you may remember uh, the last biennium where we actually uh, put a, uh, a significant amount of money towards police training. Uh, that hadn't been done for many years, and with the with the mandates that were coming from uh, this body and the other, uh, police training was starting to be uh, uh, more and more, uh, more and more intense. More and more hours are being spent required with the mandates that we were uh, putting down on on uh, law enforcement officer from training for uh, for lots of different things, and and you can. You all know, you, you've uh, been around long enough uh, to, to see the trend where law enforcement has been uh, pretty much uh, in, in the glass house here over the last couple of years, uh, and in some cases justifiably so. I don't, I don't ever say they, they weren't. However, with that amount of uh, stuff that was going on, uh, we decided to do a certain amount of training, and that was a good thing. Uh, however, this budget now has uh, trimmed it back uh, for, for obvious reasons. I think uh, Senator Latz will agree that maybe the priority this year was uh, putting some more dollars towards the uh, corrections, and, and that's very clear. We need more correction officers. Um, however, I, I, you know, I can go off a little bit on the correctional officers. Me folks, I, I, I really don't think too many people in this room appreciate and know what those correctional officers are doing on a daily basis and what kind of a responsibility that we put on their shoulders to house the people that, that uh, we don't want on our streets. 
and uh, on a daily basis they have to go to work and, and deal with those, those uh, people. Uh, that's a really, really tough job, and I think that's where they're finding that it's getting tougher and tougher to be able to find. But I, uh, sorry if I digress there. I was just talking about the post board training, and I would hate to see that trend back any further, especially in light of uh, Senator Nelson's um, bill uh, bringing forth 75 or a little bit more million dollars for school safety, which, which is going to give the schools uh, an opportunity to apply for those dollars. School boards have that option. Uh, I think this body has, uh, has done very well over the last uh, couple of years uh, after the recent tragedies in the uh, other schools uh, throughout the country. And I just wanted to make one other comment. I, I uh, noticed most recently in the news media that uh, the mayor from Minneapolis had uh, made a, a, uh, a ruling that their police officers were no longer going to be doing any high intensity, high risk tactical training. They were going to be cutting back on that and I, I, I don't know what, why they would do that other than the fact that through the eyes of some of those folks I guess um, maybe the, you know, the, the people were at least in their eyes being mistreated out there and they wanted to get back to more community based type policing. And uh, I'm just here to tell you, and I can tell you uh, uh, after the years of being on the, on the street, that community policing goes on every day. Every day you put the uniform on and you head in. That goes on. However, there is a reason why they do this high-risk tactical training. And I, I would absolutely hope that we continue to allow the officers to be able to respond to those 911 calls and those tragedies that do happen. Because when that call goes off, you're going to want those officers trained. And by cutting the post board back any, any more, I think it'd be a disservice. So uh, there, there seems to be plenty of funding for uh, school safety. Uh, uh, and I, I would suggest that we uh, vote against this amendment. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, there was some question about how many schools and how many districts we have. Off the top of my head, using the figure of about 350 districts and charters, um, the 75 million works out to be just over $200,000 on average basically per district, and if you think about how many schools there are, and, and I have actually spent a lot of time looking at the Department of Education's numbers on how districts have historically been spending the safe schools levy that we have had his, historically, and these different very important, valuable resources that Senator Nelson outlined. We agree those are important. We agree this is an important investment, but the majority of the, those are spent in um, serious additions and, uh, and, and uh, hardening of our school buildings. So re rebuilding the entrances to create a buffer zone to keep people out before they can be screened. Bulletproof glass, locks, security systems, pretty big ticket items. Um, and to Senator Nel uh, Clausen's point, what this what these resources would do with these technical experts is that they would work with so many of our districts. It is the, they would help m these districts make good, solid decisions on how best to protect the buildings, the systems, the students. And that is why I continue to maintain that a half a million dollars to support this effort that is already ongoing, as uh, Senator Clausen has described, our districts already have had these relationships. They continue to this day. They know where to turn when they want to get good, reliable answers about how best to address school safety. And they go to this office, and we need a few more people to help do that. This is an, an incredibly valuable investment with tremendous returns for our students. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment, Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I wanted to uh, answer more fully uh, Senator Limmer's questions, and I just had to check my numbers before I did so. Uh, Senator Limmer, uh, there are, um, I'll just kind of start with a, there are 845,404 students in our Minnesota schools. I should say these numbers as are of 
2013, so we're seeing increases beyond this. But the current numbers that I could get tonight, 845,404 students in Minnesota schools. Somebody asked me about, well, how many school districts is that? Members, that is 553 school districts. And Senator Limmer, to your question about, well, how many school buildings are we looking at? 2,403 school buildings. Interestingly enough, if you like to do the math, um, I should tell you one other thing. There's 53,585 teachers in Minnesota. And I found this part a little bit um, surprising. Uh, the ratio is one teacher to 16 students. Well, that might be what the numbers look like, but that's not what I've seen in the classrooms. So that makes me think there may be a lot of um, administration or perhaps people not working with students. But those are the ratios. So uh, perhaps the well-intended piece here of $250,000 spread over those large numbers uh, and over 2,403 schools, well, that'd be about $104 a school uh, if you do the math. But most importantly, uh, it's important that we get our resources to where the students are. And uh, the more I hear about the um, amendment before us, it almost sounds like it's to hire more people in the Department of Public Safety. Um, I'm not sure if that was the intent, but that's a little bit what it sounds like. So number one, I believe we should be looking at significantly more resources that can be used and deployed on a broader basis that can get to all of our schools, all of our students, all of our school districts. That is what the Safe and Secure Schools Bill, uh, Senate File 7, coming to you next week, I believe, uh, will help with. So I believe the discussion here tonight is incredibly important. But as I said, we have a much broader need than $250,000 that sounds to me like it's uh, perhaps being taken away from our police officers, which is kind of the antithesis of safety, so that doesn't exactly make sense either. Um, so again, uh, I would uh, not be uh, inclined to support uh, such an amendment at this point. Members, we're still on the amendment to the amendment, and we have several more amendments at the desk. Uh, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just responding to Senator Engelbritson uh, comment about uh, police training. Police are responsible for the protection of our children and our schools. They are the first responders if there's an emergency of an intruder, of a person with a weapon, and they prepare for this. Part of their training is working with the school safety center, local schools, EMT people, emergency personnel. They sit down together in the school building and they look at what are the needs of that building. What is the technical expertise that each of those people bring to the building to ensure that our children are safe and our schools are secure? The resources that Senator Nelson is talking about are critical. The bigger question is then, once you have the resources, how do you allocate those resources? Once again, how do you know where those cameras should go in a building? How do you evacuate a building? Where should students go in an emergency and why? All those questions deserve answers. They have to have answers before you go ahead and start spending money. The school resource personnel, that's what they do. And for the small amount of money that we're asking for, for them to reach out currently to 250 schools by adding 
two positions, we can almost double that. And that's a huge impact. We're going to have the funding, hopefully, through Senator Nelson's bill. We have to have the technical expertise to help people make good decisions on how to keep our children safe and our buildings secure. See no further discussion on the amendment to the amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Mr. President. Members, Senator Pappas, I have, I have a list. What, for what reason do you rise? I have the A49 the, amendment. Okay. Mr. I, President, I ask for a division on that last vote. Okay. Uh, Senator Clausen has asked for a division. Uh, all those members in favor of the amendment, please stand. Okay, members, please be seated. All those who are opposed to the amendment to the amendment, please stand. There being 28 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. Mr. President. Senator Pappas, I have a list on the Mr. A48 President? amendment. Next Mr. on my list is Senator Newman. Mr. President, Senator um, Pappas. point of personal privilege. For what reason do you rise? Unless people are sending you secret notes, I don't know how you could possibly have a list. I'm the one who stood up and asked to be recognized with my amendment. Senator Pappas, I have a list right here in front of me on the A48 amendment. Next on my list is Senator Newman. Senator Newman. <coughs> Senator Pappas, I will add you to the list. Senator Newman. Mr. President. Um, at, at this stage, I, I just want to make sure that I understand where we're at on the, the, uh, the amendments. The A50 amendment has now, amendment to the amendment, has now been uh, defeated, and we are back on the A48 amendment. Is that correct, Mr. That is President? correct, Senator Newman. We are on the A48 amendment. And... Um, the A48 amendment, if, if I could ask if Senator Latz would yield. Senator Latz will yield. Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Latz, it's, it's been a while since your A48 was on the floor prior to a number of, of amendments, and I've now lost track. Could you briefly explain your A48 amendment again? Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Newman, the A48 amendment makes funds available from the uh, police training account to be used, uh, uh, just put generally into um, the, uh, or actually what it does is it um, reduces the amount of money that is uh, appropriated directly to the police training account um, and, uh, and that leaves money on the bottom line. Um, on this budget bill. 
Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Latz. Uh, with that uh, explanation, uh, I would like to offer at this point, uh, Mr. President, the A53 amendment. Senator Newman offers the A53 amendment to the A48 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment to the amendment. Senator Newman moves to amend the Latz Amendment to Senate File Number 802 as follows. Page 1, delete lines 2 to 4 and insert. This is the A53 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Newman. Mr. President, um, one of the things that, that really is of concern to me uh, is the, the, the funding source uh, for the uh, A48 amendment. The, uh, the, the post board is, is something that uh, has been, at least in my estimation, very important for, for many, many years. Now, I'll go back a few years when uh, I first became a police officer in Hennepin County with the Sheriff's Department. And back in those days, there, were, there wasn't a post board. And there wasn't the training that uh, law, uh, law enforcement officers get uh, today. And if you, if you fast forward now into 2019, if you remember, there's a, there's a pretty serious uh, murder trial going on over in Hennepin County right now involving a, a real severe question concerning uh, uh, law enforcement officer training. And that is precisely what the Post Board is designed to do. And that would be to provide the law enforcement officers with the significant training that they need to handle the types of problems that they are faced with in the world today. And, and I really am concerned about um, taking the money from the post, bar, post board and then use it on the types of, of, of uh, amendments that have uh, been before the, uh, the body just recently, albeit uh, very worthwhile uh, programs. I simply wonder whether or not the proper funding source uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for these worthwhile projects is really should come out of the post board because the law enforcement training is just that important. So what I am proposing with the A53 amendment is uh, to use uh, a funding source other than the post board, and that would be with the Department of Human Rights. And the funding source, um, uh, with the uh, Department of Human Rights would involve some of their base funding and uh, also involving some of their insurance uh, uh, coverage. So uh, we, I just have noticed, uh, uh, Mr. President, that the A53 amendment uh, will not work uh, as the A48 amendment uh, currently stands, so I would like to withdraw the A53 amendment, Mr. Uh, President, and offer instead uh, the A54 amendment to the amendment. Senator Newman withdraws the A53 amendment to the amendment and offers, Senator Newman offers the A54 amendment to the amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment to the amendment. Senator Newman moves to amend the Latz Amendment to Senate File Number 802 as follows. Page 1, delete lines 2 to 4 and insert. This is the A54 Amendment. To the amendment, to the amendment. To the amendment, to the amendment, Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the A54 amendment uh, does address uh, the, uh, funds out of the uh, Minnesota Department of Human Rights uh, and uh, takes $75,000 per year uh, out of the uh, biennium and, and uh, uh, from the uh, health insurance uh, increases and applies that money to fund the uh, Indigenous Women's uh, Amendment, which is the A51 Amendment, I believe, Mr. President. 
All right, members, we are on the A54 amendment to the A48 amendment. Any discussion? Senator Latz. Well, Mr. President, I, I, I'm really stunned. I'm really stunned that there would even be a consideration of forcing existing employees of our Human Rights Department to pay an additional $150,000 for their own health insurance, especially when uh, this budget doesn't even give them any salary increase. So it, it would literally take the money out of the pockets of our state Human Rights Department employees in order to fund the uh, Indigenous Women Task Force. Words can't describe how discombobulated that concept even is. And if members of this body would be willing to vote in favor of forcing the Human Rights Department state employees to pay for the task force, go for it. I demand a, uh, a roll call. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Any further discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll. All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 32 nays, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, we are back on the A48 amendment as amended. Next on my list is Senator Pappas. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, with the passage of this amendment to the amendment, um, the uh, majority has just, uh, in effect, I, I just, it's just unbelievable to me that we now have a recorded vote of a majority of the members of this body voting to force state employees to pay out of their own pocket for a task force that everyone in this body agrees, um, almost everyone in this body, I think, agrees uh, it should be uh, paid for out of um, the state general fund uh, because, in fact, um, I was on the floor during the voice vote um, on Senator Torres Ray's amendment, and there was not one audible uh, no vote um, on that amendment. Uh, so, uh, you know, I guess uh, members of the majority are going to have to explain uh, their vote to their constituents at some point um, on the health department employees uh, that they're willing to literally rob money out of state employees' pockets to be able to pay for that. Uh, but uh, that's the position that we're left in um, at this point, and I withdraw the A48 amendment. Senator Latz withdraws the A48 amendment. Members, we are back on the bill. Senate File 802, further discussion. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to offer the A38 amendment. Senator Dibble offers the A38 amendment. 
The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dibble. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate File Number 802 as follows, page 16 after line 32. Insert. This is the A38 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Uh, the A38 amendment corresponds to my Senate File 755, um, uh, for which, uh, which I introduced and requested hearings and received none. I spent some time discussing this matter with the, the chair. Um, I was hopeful that we would get this uh, this matter considered in committee, we did not. So I'm taking the opportunity here to uh, to at least discuss it a little bit. Uh, basically, uh, Mr. President, members, uh, non-birth parents are are effectively being uh, required to adopt uh, their spouse's birth child, arguably their own children. Uh, in those circumstances, specific circumstances when married parents utilize assist assisted reproductive technology. Uh, uh, and this is the instance when uh, the married couples are uh, two women. Uh, that circumstance does not apply when the married couple are, are of opposite gender. So this simply remedies that deficiency in our law and this practice that is subjecting uh, those parents to uh, a great deal of expense and no small amount of indignity uh, uh, that they should not otherwise be subjected to. If you think about uh, the adoption process and all of the expense, the home studies, the justifying your, your good character and your good nature, um, et cetera, where uh, other uh, parents wouldn't be subjected to that. So, uh, Mr. President, uh, I would encourage a yes vote and request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. A roll call granted. Further discussion on this President. Senator Limmer. Mr. President, uh, I believe this. This bill, although it, it may be worthy of discussion, uh, but not on this particular bill. As I started out uh, with the presentation of this bill, this is purely a financial bill that we're trying to cover expenses. And um, Senator Dibble's bill goes, is intended to accomplish a substantially different purpose than what this bill is. Uh, there's no reference to assisted reproduction in this bill. Uh, this is a finance bill, and uh, I believe this particular amendment is not germane. Senator Limmer uh, rises for a point of order on germaneness. Uh, advice, Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I, I did notice that the Article 2 says uh, policy matters that pertain to appropriations, but as I was reading through those policy matters, I don't really uh, track them back to the uh, the first article that has to do with appropriations. Um, uh, I think some of them are indeed actually uh, freestanding um, uh, policy matters. Maybe Senator Limmer can relate each of them back for us to um, uh, to the appropriations in in the first article. Otherwise, I think you know this is this is the Judiciary uh, Public Safety Omnibus Bill um, that carries a, a pretty broad breadth of, of subject matters in it and. Uh, uh, that aren't necessarily related to each other, so I think this is appropriate uh, to, to be amended to this bill. Further advice? Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Dibble is partially correct. Uh, Judiciary and Public Safety omnibus bill, or budget bill is what this is, heavy on the budget. Uh, also, Senator Dibble's amendment refers to state statute 257, and we do not have any reference to 257 in this particular bill. This proposal, this amendment, uh, clearly is intended to accomplish a substantially different purpose than the bill. Members, I rule that the point of order is well taken and the amendment is not germane. Mr. Senator President, Dibble. I'd like to appeal the ruling of the chair and request a roll call. Senator Dibble is appealing the ruling of the President. Uh, the question before the body is, shall the decision of the President be the judgment of the Senate? A green vote is in favor of the judgment of the uh, President. A red vote is against the judgment of the President. The Secretary will take the roll.
All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 38 ayes and 28 nays, the decision of the president is sustained. Members, we're back on Senate file 802, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, we'll, we'll try again here. Uh, I'll offer the A45 amendment. Senator Dibble offers the A45 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate file number 802 as follows, page 16 after line 32. Insert. This is the A45 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, the uh, a45 amendment uh, corresponds to my Senate file 233. Uh, members, the history of my community is filled with instances of terrible assaults and homicides. You won't find a single LGBTQ person who doesn't know someone either directly or through friends who was li whose life was ended violently. Sadly, in the aftermath of these tragedies, the assailant often uses the, the defense of blaming the victim, somehow finding, trying to argue that that person, just by virtue of their uh, LGBTQ identity or orientation uh, was so alarming to the assailant as to cause them to uh, uh, have a panic disorder uh, episode and lose entirely their own self-control. The murders of Matthew Shepard, uh, the murderers uh, used the, panic def the LGBTQ panic and trans defense um, uh, to argue for a lenient sentence. It was used in the case of a man running for, for mayor. Uh, back in, in 2013, Marco McMillan. It was used in the case of a transgender woman who was murdered in her own apartment in downtown Minneapolis. Chrissy Bates in 2011. High school boy who was cut down right in front of his own peers uh, in just a few years ago. This, of course, is nonsense. This, this argument has been discredited by the American Psychiatric Association. Use of this defense persists in the legal arena, nevertheless, and it is, of course, a function of widespread societal disregard uh, for our murders. It sends the message that our lives are less valuable and, and our, our lives are worth less than others. I would request a roll call vote and would encourage members to follow the lead of many, many other states in barring the gay trans panic defense as a legitimate defense in the court of law. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Point of order, Mr. President. Senator Limmer, for what reason do you rise? Uh, Mr. President, in reviewing this particular amendment of Senator Dibble, um, I'm reviewing it quickly, but I don't believe there is a financial reference uh, to this. This is straight policy only, and that is not included in our bill. Um, Mr. Chair, I believe that this is a non-germane issue uh, before us, and it moves this particular bill in a substantially different uh, direction. Uh, every reference that we've had on policy has been associated with a cost. This particular amendment does not. Senator Limmer is challenging the germaneness of the amendment. Advice? Senator Dibble. Uh, well, uh, Mr. President, um, again, uh, this is a bill uh, which, for which I requested uh, a hearing and was denied as such, so this is our opportunity uh, to have this discussion and, and decide uh, whether or not we're going to uh, stand up for people who are otherwise marginalized and victimized. I would encourage folks um, to, to vote uh, if, in fact, we're ruled, uh, don't receive a favorable ruling to, to, to stand uh, with this amendment. Um, I did review um, the elements that are uh, covered in the bill, and um, this, of course, is written to uh, amendments to Chapter 609. There's quite a bit of language that uh, deals with uh, uh, policy items that deal with Chapter 609, uh, which are, are widely supported by both sides of the aisle. Uh, Senator Pappas is involved in, in a number of those provisions, um, and so I think it actually does is consistent with what the bill is hoping to achieve. Again, um, I don't see how uh, a lot of these elements tie back to Article 1, even though Article 2 is, is labeled as such. I think this is a fairly wide-ranging uh, omnibus judiciary uh, and uh, public safety uh, omnibus bill, and think this would be consistent with the provisions that are already therein. 
Further advice, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, despite the fact that there's a reference to 609, every uh, reference that is in the existing bill is a 609 provision that is related and has an appropriation attached. This, this particular amendment does not, and I do raise the question on Rule 35.2 that this is intended to, in, to accomplish a substantially different purpose rather than trying to satisfy a budget. I rule that the point, of, the point of order is well taken and the amendment is not germane. Further discussion, Senator Dibble. Uh, Mr. President, I would appeal the ruling of the chair and request a roll call. Senator Dibble is appealing the ruling of the President. Uh, once again, members, uh, the question before the body is, shall the decision of the President be the judgment of the Senate? A green vote is in favor of the judgment of the President. A red vote is against the judgment of the President. The Secretary will take the roll. All senators having voted, who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 36 ayes and 30 nays, the decision of the president is sustained. Members, we're back on Senate File 802, Senator Dibble. Mr. President, third time's a charm. <laughs> I'll go fast because <laughs> uh, I have a hunch I know how this one's going to wind up as well. Um, but I would like to offer the A44. Senator Dibble offers the A44 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate file number 802 as follows, page 31 after line 5 insert. This is the A44 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The uh, A44 corresponds to my Senate file 2198. Um, and uh, just very quickly, the crux of the, uh, of the uh, bill is to uh, move uh, marijuana, cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. Uh, Schedule 1, as you know, uh, uh, show, is, a, is a determination, uh, ascertains that uh, a substance has uh, no possible medicinal use. Schedule 2 says it does and can be prescribed or, or uh, delivered to individuals under very tightly controlled circumstances. It also, however, uh, updates the definition of a small amount of marijuana. Point of order, include... Mr. President. Senator Limmer, for what reason do you rise? Uh, Mr. President, uh, in reviewing this particular bill, I see that the A44 amendment is going in a direction that would violate Rule 35.2, that this particular amendment is uh, intended to accomplish a substantially different purpose of what the intent of this bill is. Again, the reference of this bill is a budget bill. This appears to be a pure policy bill. It goes in the direction of marijuana, uh, Section 152. I don't believe there's any references in this particular bill regarding state statute 2018. Senator Limmer is raising a point of order stating that the amendment is not germane or challenging the germaneness of the amendment. Uh, advice, uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I would uh, disagree with uh, Senator Limmer. Uh, I, uh, like I said before, I think this is a fairly broadly construed uh, bill. It's the Omnibus Judiciary Public Safety Bill. I think it would be appropriate. Um, 
It updates the definition of small amount of, of marijuana so that other types of, of substances that are marijuana derivatives, that has to do with uh, criminal possession laws. It disallows the use of, of uh, water pipe water as, the, as, a, as a part of the weight measure, uh, again, for the purpose of, of reducing the criminal penalties. It offers expungement to those who have been found guilty uh, of, uh, of possession of, of uh, uh, substances that aren't actual the, actually the plant should, should this actually become law, um, and uh, a number of provisions to make sure that if it were to move to Schedule II that it's consistent with how, how Schedule II uh, substances are obtained and, and administered and managed. So I think um, in keeping with the spirit of the, the broad scope of, of the bill that Senator Limmer offers, this is appropriately attached to this omnibus bill. I rule that the point of order is well taken and the amendment is not germane. Mr. President. Senator Dibble. I would like to appeal the ruling of the chair and request a roll call. Senator Dibble is appealing the ruling of the president and has requested a roll call. Once again, members, uh, sh uh, the question before the body is, shall the decision of the pre president be the judgment of the Senate? A green vote is in favor of the judgment of the president. A red vote is against the judgment of the president. The point Senate of order. We'll, uh, the secretary will take the roll. Point of order, Mr. President. Uh, we're in the middle of a vote. The secretary will take the roll. All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 31 nays, the decision of the president is sustained. Senator Jensen. Point of order, Mr. President. I just want to let you know that on that last amendment, please probably state your point of order, Senator Jensen. It is. There's two amendments that were passed out to us that were combined. So the, the amendments that I'm looking at in terms of what we we're voting on had both A44 and A45, and it did have language referencing conversion therapy. And that's why there was some confusion as why people were looking at what was the amendment really pertaining to. Thank you, Senator Jensen. Members, we are back on Senate File 802. Senator Lance. Mr. President, I have the A55 amendment. Senator Latz offers the A55 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Latz moves. Senator Latz moves to amend Senate File Number 802 as follows: Page 10, Line 25, Delete. This is the A55 amendment. Pre Mr. President. Senator Pappas. I have the A56 amendment to the amendment. Senator Pappas has the A56 amendment to the A55 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment to the amendment. Mr. President. Sen Senator Pappas moves to Mr. amend the Latz amendment to Senate file number 802 as follows, page one after line one, insert. This is the A56 amendment. Senator Hall, for what reason do you rise? Mr. President, can we just slow down a second? We haven't got either of these amendments up on our computers yet. Uh, both amendments are up on the computer. 
Uh, Senator Pappas, to the A56 amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm happy to be on the list again. Um, members, um, I, like many Americans and Minnesotans, come from a military family. Um, I was really kind of surprised when I looked back at my family history. So my grandfather served in World War I. I have a father, an uncle, and a stepfather who served in World War II. I have an uncle who was a Korean War veteran and um, uh, Air Force uh, military. Uh, my husband is a Vietnam veteran. My brother's nephew was an Iraq War veteran. And I have many friends in the National Guard. And like many veterans, some have struggled with alcoholism, with depression, and with anger issues. This legislation would support the Domestic Abuse Project Change Step Program, which supports veterans and their families. In 2010, the Hennepin County Probation Department created the Hennepin County Veterans Court in order to better serve veteran defendants struggling with addiction, mental illness, and, and or co-occurring disorders. Along with the creation of the court, Hennepin County asked the Domestic Abuse Project to create a domestic violence program for men who have served in the military. It's called Change Step. Change Step is a group therapy program for men who have served or are currently serving in the military who have used abusive behaviors in their relationships. Our veterans members are heroes who may return home without the tools needed to reintegrate. They're trained to get the job done in combat, but not always how to rejoin civilian society, take care of their families, and be healthy. This program, in this program, 96% of veterans who complete the program do not reoffend within one year. I believe this is an essential program to support our veterans, and I ask for your support. Members, further discussion on the amendment to the Mr. Amendment. President, I'd like a roll call. A roll call has been requested. A roll call granted. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, would the author of the amendment yield? Senator Pappas will yield. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Pappas, uh, you made a reference to an organization that deals with veterans, I believe, and was that the, could you tell me what the name of that was? I didn't hear it. There was little noise back where I am. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President. It's called the Domestic Abuse Prevention Program. And Senator Mr. Limmer. And Mr. Uh, President, Senator Pappas, you made a reference to a, a term called change step. Is that it? Is that a program or is that the organization? Senator I Pappas. haven't heard of it. And Senator Pappas will yield. Senator Pappas. Senator Limmer, the Change Step, it's a group therapy program for men who have served or are serving in the military. And the, the organization, the Domestic Abuse Prevention Program, was specifically asked by Hennepin County to, cr to uh, create this program for veterans in conjunction with their um, veterans court. Um, however, it is now available outside of Hennepin County, and they actually have served more than 200 veterans from 15 counties across Minnesota. Mr. President. Senator Limmer. Thank you. And Senator Pappas, uh, how long has this organization been active? Senator I Pappas. Haven't, the reason I'm asking Senator Pappas is I'm completely unaware of this organization. Senator Pappas will yield. Senator Pappas. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Limmer, I did talk about it in committee. Uh, the project has existed since 1979. Uh, Mr. President. Senator Limmer. Uh, does this get into uh, treatment modalities uh, with those that are addicted to drugs or opioids, do you know? Senator Pappas will yield. Senator Pappas. Thank you. Uh, according to the information I have, Senator Limmer, it's, it's a group therapy program. It has two major components, um, education and process or therapy time. And the men explore um, topics such as understanding the cycle of abuse, discussing gender norms, practicing communication, taking responsibility for an abusive incident, and the effects of violence on children. 
um, the veterans who go through the change step are encouraged to attend a circle of security group to regain healthy relationships with their children, as well as work with a change step case manager to understand the resources available to them. Um, such as the, the VA, for example, the case manager will help them navigate the complex VA system as well as other social service systems. Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Pappas, I see that on lines 12 and 13, the grantee must offer a combination of services uh, for perpetrators of domestic violence and their families. Does this mean that the, this is directed toward a, a veterans program, a veteran that would be guilty of being a perpetrator of domestic violence? Senator Pappas will yield. Senator Pappas. Yes, Senator Limmer, sometimes they're referred to the program by the court, and it may be a... Um, an alternative to uh, jail time. And although I think 50% of the veterans are self-referred, meaning they have um, uh, experienced abu abusive behavior from themselves and they're trying to end the abuse. Mr. President. Senator Limmer. Mr. President, um, I believe that the A56 amendment would be a friendly amendment. Further discussion on the a56 amendment. And a roll call to, has been called, has it? A roll call has been called, yes. Uh, any further discussion on the A56 amendment to the amendment? Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the amendment to the amendment. I'm sorry, Mr. President, I did not hear someone was talking to me that Senator Limmer said he was okay with the amendment. All right, then I withdraw my request for a roll call. I don't want to take our time. We're already in the roll call. Sorry. Mr. President. Members, please vote. I ask for a roll call. <laughs> Members, we're voting. Please vote. Gotta be sure. All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 67 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, uh, we're back on the A55 amendment. Senator Newman. Mr. President, um, obviously the, the, the Senate felt that the uh, A56 amendment was appropriate, a good idea. Uh, as I did. Uh, however, uh, I remain concerned with respect to the funding source, and therefore I offer the A57 amendment to the amendment. Senator Newman offers the A57 amendment to the A55 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator the amendment. Newman moves to amend the Lats amendment to Senate file number 82 as follows. Page 1 deletes line 2 to 4 and insert this is the A57 amendment. To the amendment to the amendment, Senator Newman. Mr. President, uh, while the uh, program outlined in the A56 amendment uh, is indeed important, uh, so is the uh, Minnesota Post Board and the training that it provides for our law enforcement officers. Uh, and that, uh, in my mind, is unfortunately the for funding source for the uh, domestic abuse prevention grants described in the A56 amendment. Therefore, uh, with the A57 amendment to the amendment, uh, we will 
uh, draw the funding source for the domestic abuse prevention grants from the Minnesota Department of Human Rights uh, with uh, the money being uh, used uh, for the uh, uh, increase in health insurance and from the base. Discussion on the amendment to the amendment. Senator Latz. Mr. President, I will consider Senator Newman's amendment a friendly amendment. Any further discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So members, we are now back on the A55 amendment as amended. Any further discussion on the amendment? See none. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. no. Motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, we're back on Senate File 802. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will give Senate File 802 its third reading. Senate File Number 802, a bill for an act relating to public safety, appropriating money for public safety, courts, corrections, human rights, etc. See, Senator Bigham is on my list. She's been waiting very patiently. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Latz did a fantastic job describing the inadequacy of this budget. And members, we know that last year was an incredibly difficult year for the Department of Corrections. Two correctional officers uh, were murdered. Never in the history of the state of Minnesota had a correctional officer been murdered in the line of duty, and two, in 2000, two heroes in 2018 lost their lives. Senator two officers. Bigham. Senator Bigham, hold on one moment, please. Members, it was getting a little loud. If we can please uh, keep the volume down so we can hear Senator Bigham. Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, two heroes did not get to go home to their families that night. The Department of Corrections needs additional funding to hire more correctional officers. As Sergeant Magel from the Department of Corrections uh, says, we no longer can hear prison, we can no longer hear prisons are short staffed and kick the can down the road because two fine Minnesotans died. We are a great state of people who owe one another better. Members, we can and we should do better. This bill does not include a simple operating adjustment increase, let alone funding to add the appropriate number of correctional officers. This bill actually means a net cut to correctional officers' positions. I want to thank the correctional officers who came to the Capitol to advocate for additional funding. I want to thank the correctional officers' families who came to the Capitol and who contacted me to advocate for additional funding for correctional officers. Members, I know this bill is going to pass, and I hope this bill comes back to, uh, from conference committee with more money for correctional officers so we can say that officers Gom and Parisi were not lost in vain and that correctional officers across the state have a safe place to work and we are not kicking the can down the road again. Please vote no on this bill. Final discussion on Senate File 802, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Commissioner Fran spoke to the Finance Committee, I think it was yesterday, I've lost track of days, yesterday or the day before, and he told Finance Committee that the governor is ready to negotiate and he expects good budgets from the House and Senate, reflecting the views of House and Senate members. But he said he wanted them to be responsible budgets, focusing on their priorities, budgets to start the negotiation process. But the trouble I have with what we're doing here is that I don't think this is responsible budgeting. And what I mean by that, I, I really question, I think Senator Latz asked some really good questions earlier. I think he actually asked Senator Limmer if he thought this was a good bill. And I don't know, Senator Limmer, if you do believe it's a good bill or not, but I, I do know it's not responsible. I don't think you or anybody believes that the employee health benefits that you're providing first and second year funding for 
because of the increased cost of health care are going to disappear two years later when you don't have any funding for it. That one-time funding for health care for employees disappears after a two-year period. I don't think you believe that we shouldn't be providing the health care for inmates, which we're constitutionally obligated to provide funding for. I don't believe that that's responsible budgeting. The Constitution requires us to provide health care to them, and the expensive has been getting higher because hepatitis C and other things with some very expensive medications. So this budget isn't one that would work. It just doesn't work. And I saw one of the Republican caucus tweets showing how you care so deeply about how we have to put more correctional officers online because of the safety risks. And the commissioner's letter says that the overall budget impact of this bill will cause a cut. And I think Senator Latz read the numbers, 78 currently employed correctional officers would be laid off if this bill was enacted. And the next biennium more would. That's not a responsible budget. I think when the governor says he expects differences between the House and Senate, it's because there are different philosophies between the majority here and the majority there. But you can't really be saying you expect to have health care costs disappear in two years. You can't really be serious when you say, we want more correctional officers, and you provide a budget that's going to cut correctional officers. Again, this is all done because of the same thing, because we didn't have a choice because of the targets. And Senator Limmer, I've heard you say you don't think these are good, you, you weren't happy with the target, and this is what you got to live with. But again, those are targets set by your caucus. If you don't like the targets, change them. And if you want to have a responsible budget, you don't have health care costs disappear in two years as if they're not real. So I think the Commissioner Franz's warning to the Finance Commission Committee is one that we should take seriously. Pass a bill. You're the majority. You're going to pass this bill. But pass a bill that's responsible, that actually works. Don't pass a bill you can say, well, this is going to be a starting position because it's not going to end up that way. Pass a bill that would work if you got exactly what you wanted. But you can't want this. You can't want health care to disappear. You can't want the cuts in correctional officers. Take seriously your responsibility to propose a budget that works. Uh, one I may not agree with, but at least one that works. And this budget doesn't work. And I think we can do better than this. Final discussion on Senate File 802. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, <clears throat> I got a couple of final thoughts here. Uh, one, um, there might be some people surprised that we did not offer any specific amendments relating to reducing gun violence. Um, I will note that the chairman of the committee was quoted in the media today as saying that these are the kind of bills that should go through the process of the committee as separate bills um, and be passed out of the Judiciary Committee for us to consider them. Well, I will say only, members, that after a year and a half, we're still waiting for a Judiciary Committee hearing on the Universal Background Check Bill and the Red Flag or Extreme Risk Protection Order Bill. Um, the only thing standing in the way of those hearings is the will of the majority, or at least the majority leadership that's making those committee decisions. With regard to the budget, uh, frankly, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed on behalf of Chairman Limmer and the GOP, because I know that Chairman Limmer is chafing at the budget target uh, for this bill. Let there be no mistake, this is a cut budget. In real terms, as anyone who took Economics 101 understands, this is a cut budget because in real terms, after you account for inflation or the increase in fixed costs that have to be paid for, like electricity, heat, food, 
When you pay for those, in real terms, you simply cannot maintain the same service levels. You've got other places in the budget that you have to cut. And we're not in a deficit year, so why are we treating our budget like we are in a deficit year? And in particular, why are we treating our budget with regard to judiciary and public safety and the Department of Corrections like we are in a deficit year? We are cutting the independent third branch of state government, the constitutionally independent branch of government in our judiciary. We are cutting our state system for solving and preventing crime. We are cutting our system that houses and treats our offenders, 95% of whom are going to be released back into our communities. And then we're also cutting the system that supervises them when they are released back into the communities. We will pay one way or the other, now or later. Eventually, we will pay the price, either an increased cost of incarceration, increased costs as people move through the court system, charged with more crimes. We will pay the price as victims of those crimes in human loss and in financial loss. But we will pay. The only question is, do we pay now with a responsible budget that treats the prisoners within our, in our system with chemical dependency treatment, mental health services, sex offender treatment, so when they are released back into the community, they are much less likely to reoffend? Do we pay now to have adequate resources to use known, proven tactics and current technology to fight crime? Uh, you know, members, sometimes I feel like we are in an artificial bubble here. We seem to think that we've got this only $25 million increase over base as our budget target, and that's something that's locked in stone. But as Senator Marty said, these are artificially created parameters. We in the legislature decide our own revenue levels. We decide whether to cut taxes or raise taxes, whether to cut fees and fines or, or whether to raise fees and fines. And we can have legitimate policy discussions about what level of fees or fines or taxes or tuition, as we talked about earlier this evening, is appropriate to fund the level of services that we decide on behalf of the people we represent that we want to provide to the people of Minnesota. But we decide the size of the pie. And we also decide where to put the money that's in the pie and how big each slice of pie will be. And because we decide, this budget indeed itself reflects the majority's decisions and priorities. They've decided how they want to spend the money. They've decided how they want to raise the money and how to spend it. This blueprint that we have in front of us cannot be simply written off as a negotiating position. That's too superficial. This is the majority's preferred budget. Their priorities, their moral statement about how we ought to be spending, raising money and spending money in the state of Minnesota. As many before me have said, a budget is a moral document. Members, this budget is seriously lacking. Final discussion on Senate File 802, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, we've had a good discussion today. The uh, fact remains that this area of budget will receive more money than it currently has. The uh, budget that we will now be proposing is $2.38 billion. And I may want to point out that, that may have been lost in the discussion that if you want to vote for this bill, you'd be voting for an increase in budget. Yeah, it may not be as big as what others may want or, or think that this area needs. But I also would like to point out that if you wanted to vote against this, you're going to be voting against 
a budget that allocates 300,000 to make additional security grants to update faith-based nonprofit organizations who may be at risk of being targeted by violent extremism. Something that's rather re relatively new in our world today, but unfortunately, it's a sign of the times. That wasn't in previous budgets except just the last one, but we now are beginning to realize that there is a responsibility there that doesn't seem to be on, on too many uh, budget sheets a few years ago. You would be voting against increased sentencing for those who produce or sell child pornography. You would be voting against the funding for the marital rape defense. You would be voting against the bill that enhances penalties and requires predatory offender registration for those who spy on minors with sexual intent. You'd be voting against holding, holding police officers that might take advantage of someone as they engage, engage in sexual conduct against someone that's in their custody. So I would suggest that although the numbers may not satisfy everyone in the room, there's some tremendously good policy directions in this bill things that our community would demand us to support. And I may remind you, this is, this is the budget proposal of the Senate. We have the other chamber that has something, a record-breaking bill of over 200 pages. That's just the criminal provision, and then they've got the civil law provision that's another 60 to 65 pages. And of course, that matches up with their big bill of over 1,000 pages that we've all read, heard about. And so um, I would like to think that we're going to have a robust discussion in the next few weeks. Uh, but nevertheless, I hope that you consider the good things in this bill and the things that we tried to finance that are really on the cutting edge of what Minnesota really needs in the areas of protecting kids and others uh, from sexual exploitation. I, I would certainly urge you to move along with the process and support this bill. Members, we are on final passage of Senate File 802 as amended. See no further discussion. The Secretary will take the roll. All senators having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 44 ayes and 23 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Remaining under motions and resolutions, we will revert to the third order of business, messages from the House. The secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the passage by the House of the following House file here with transmitted, House file number 2208, a bill for an act relating to state government. Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. There's no action required on that message. Moving to the fourth order of business, first reading of House bills. House file number 2208 will be referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration for comparison with Senate file number 2611. First reading. Moving to the next order of business, which is the fourth order of business, reports of committee. The secretary will read the reports. 
Senator Rosen from the Committee on Finance, to which was re-referred Senate File Number 2611, a bill for an act relating to jobs, appropriating money for the Department of Employment and Economic Development, reports the same back with the recommendation that the bill, as amended, be fo uh, as follows, and when so amended, the bill do pass. Senator Rosen from the Committee on Finance, to which was re-referred Senate File Number 1093, a bill for an act relating to transportation, establishing a budget for transportation, reports the same back with a recommendation that the bill be amended as follows, and when so amended, the bill do pass. Senator Gazelka. No. Uh, oh yes, to commit. Mr. President, I move the Senate do now adjourn until no, Thursday. Senator Gazelka, no. no. Uh, you're moving to adopt the committee reports oh, read sorry. by the secretary. <laughs> Mr. President, move that the committee report uh, read by the secretary be adopted. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. no. Motion prevails. Moving to the sixth order of business, second reading of Senate bills, the secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate files number 2611 and 1093. Second reading. Members, uh, moving to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Senator Cohn from 12 noon to 12.35 p.m. Senator Rosen. Announcements of Senate interest, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. President. And for members of the Finance Committee, good news. We're going to start at 9 o'clock <laughs> instead of 8.30. That was a... Big, big, big break on there. <laughs> but we do have a very long day tomorrow. And if you thought the last two days were long, this is going to be very long. We're going to finish up with Senator Abler's bill, uh, starting on amendments. And then we, uh, then we are on the floor. And then we're going to go start uh, with Senator Benson's bill. And we need to get this finished tomorrow. So if we need to be here till midnight tomorrow night, we will be, because we need to finish up HHS. Thank you. Members, any further announcements of Senate interest? Senator Gazelka. Uh, so, members, Mr. President, members, I was just testing you to see if you knew where I was and what I was supposed to be doing. But uh, before we uh, adjourn here, I just want to say, um, you know, yes, we have some of the uh, pushing back and forth, but I've seen across the committees uh, a lot of good work being done. Uh, I think people on both sides finding some things that the other side is actually doing that's actually good. And uh, let's find a way to get those things done over the finish line. So with that, Mr. President, uh, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Thursday, April 25th at 11 a.m. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. No. The motion prevails. The Senate is adjourned. <laughs>